Section 30 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Abai in May 2021. Chapter 28 Over the Ankil Yung Pass. Finding the Taidong totally impracticable, and being limited as to time by the approach of the closing of the river below Pyongyang by ice, I regretfully turned southwards, and journeyed solewards by another route of much interest, which touches here and there the right bank of the Taidong. As I sat amidst the dirt, squalor, rubbish, and odd and endism of the inn-yard before starting, surrounded by an apathetic, dirty, vacant-looking, open-mouthed crowd steeped in poverty, I felt Korea to be hopeless, helpless, pitiable, piteous, a mere shuttlecock of certain great powers, and that there is no hope for her population of twelve or fourteen millions unless it is taken in hand by Russia, under whose rule, giving security for the gains of industry as well as light taxation, I had seen Koreans in hundreds transformed into energetic, thriving peasant farmers in eastern Siberia. The road, which was said, and truly, to be a very bad one, crosses a small plain, and passing under a roofed gateway between two hills, which are scarred by remains of fortifications running east and west, enters upon really fine scenery which becomes magnificent in about thirty li, at first a fertile mountain-girdled basin, whose rim is spotted with large villages, and then a narrowing valley with stony soil and a sparse population, walled in by savage mountains of empathetic forms, swinging apart at times, and revealing loftier peaks and ranges, then glittering with new-fallen snow. In crossing the plain at a point where the road was good, I was remarking to Mr. Yi what a pleasant and prosperous journey we had had, and hoping our good fortune might continue, when there was a sudden clash and flurry, I was nearly kicked off my pony, and in a moment we were in the midst of disaster. One baggage pony was on his back on his load, pawing the air in the middle of a ploughed field, his mapu helpless for the time, lamed by a kick above the knee, sobbing, blood and tears running down his face. The other baggage animal, having divested himself of Im, was kicking off the rest of his load, and Im, who had been thrown from the top of the pack, was sitting on the roadside, evidently in intense pain, all the work of a moment. Mr. Yi called to me that the soldier had broken his ankle, and it was a great relief when he rose and walked toward me. Everything breakable was broken, except my photographic camera, which I did not look at for two days for fear of what I might find. Leaving the men to get the loads and ponies together, we walked on to a hamlet so destitute as not to be able to provide either wood or wadding for a splint. I picked up a thick faggot, however, which had been dropped from a load, and it was thinned into being usable with a hatchet, the only tool the village possessed, and after padding it with a pair of stockings, and making a six-yard bandage out of a cotton garment, I put up Im's right arm, which was broken just above the wrist, in splints, and made a sling out of one of the two towels which the rats had left to me. I should have been glad to know Korean enough to rate the gossiping Mapu, three men to two horses, who allowed the accident to happen. The animals always fight if they are left to themselves, and loads and riders are nowhere. One day Mr. Yi had a bit of a finger taken off in a fight, and if a strange brute had not kicked my stirrup iron, which was bent by the blow, instead of myself, I should have had a broken ankle. When we halted at midday, the villagers tried hard to induce him to have his arm needled to let out the bad blood, a most risky surgical proceeding which often destroys the usefulness of a limb for life, and he was anxious for it, but yielded to persuasion. Being delayed by this accident, it was late when we started to cross the pass of Ankil-Yung, 
regarded as the most dangerous in Korea, owing to its liability to sudden fogs and violent storms, 3,346 feet in altitude, and said to be 30 li long. The infamous path traverses a wild rocky glen with an impetuous torrent at its bottom, and only a few wretched hamlets, in which the hovels are indistinguishable from the millet and brushwood stacks, along its length of several miles. Poverty, limiting the people to the barest necessaries of life, is the lot of the peasant in that region, but I believe that his dirty and squalid habits give an impression of want which does not actually exist. I doubt much whether any Koreans are unable to provide themselves with two daily meals of millet, with clothes sufficient for decency in summer and for warmth in winter, and with fuel, grass, leaves, twigs, and weeds, enough to keep their miserable rooms at a temperature of 70 degrees and more by means of the hot floor. To the west, the valley is absolutely closed in by a wall of peaks. The bridle path, a well-engineered road, when it ascends the very steep ridge of the watershed in many zigzags, rests for 100 feet and descends the western side by 75 turns. Except in Tibet, I never saw so apparently insurmountable an obstacle, but it does not present any real difficulty. The ascent took 70 minutes. Rain fell very heavily, but the superb view to the northeast was scarcely obscured. At the top, which is only 100 feet wide, there is a celebrated shrine to the demon of the past. To him, all travellers put up petitions for deliverance from the many malignant spirits who are waiting to injure them, and for a safe descent. The shrine contains many strips of paper inscribed with the names of those who have made special payments for special prayers, and a few wreaths and posies of faded paper flowers. The woman who lives in the one hovel on the pass makes a good living by receiving money from travellers who offer rice cakes and desire prayers. The worship is nearly all done by proxy, and the rice cakes do duty any number of times. Besides the shrine and a one-roomed hovel, there are some open sheds made of millet stalks to give shelter during storms. The Ankil Yung Pass is blocked by snow for three months of the year, but at other times is much used, in spite of its great height. Excellent potatoes are grown on the mountain slopes at an altitude exceeding 3,000 feet, and round Tok Chong they are largely cultivated and enter into the diet of the people, never having had the disease. Darkness came on prematurely with the heavy rain, and we asked the shrine-keeper to give us shelter for the night, but she said that to take in six men and a foreign woman was impossible, as she had only one room. But it was equally impossible for us to descend the pass in the darkness with tired ponies, and after half an hour's altercation the matter was arranged, Im, who retained his wits, securing for me a degree of privacy by hanging some heavy mats from a beam, giving me, I am sure, the lion's share of the apartment. Really, the accommodation was not much worse than usual, but though the mercury fell to the freezing point, the hot floor kept the inside temperature up to 83 degrees, and the dread of tigers on the part of my hostess forbade my having even a chink of the door open. The rain cleared off in time for the last sunset gleam on the distant mountains, which, when darkness fell on the pass, burned fiery red against a strip of pale green sky, taking on afterwards one by one the ashy look of death as the light died off from their snows. All about Ankil Yung the mountains are wooded to their summits with deciduous trees, the ubiquitous Pinus sinensis being rare. But to the northward, in the direction of Paik Tu San, the character of the scenery changes, and peaks and precipices of naked rock, and lofty mountain monoliths with snow-crowned ranges beyond, form by far the grandest view that I saw in this land of hill and valley. Then Im had to be attended to, 
and though I was very anxious about him, I could not be blind to the picturesqueness of the scene in the hovel. Mr. Yi sitting in my chair holding the candle, the soldier with his face puckered with pain squatting on the floor with his swollen arm lying on a writing board on my lap and no room to move. I failed there as elsewhere to get a better piece of wood for the splint, which was too short, and I could only get wadding for padding it by taking some out of Im's sleeve, and all the time and afterwards I was very anxious for fear that I had put the bandage on too tightly or too loosely, and that my want of experience would give the poor fellow a useless right arm. He was in severe pain all that night, but he was very plucky about it, made no fuss, and never allowed me to suffer in the slightest degree from his accident. Indeed, he was even more attentive than before. He said to Mr. Yi, The foreign woman looked so sorry, and touched my arm as if I had been one of her own people, I shall do my best. And so he did. I had indulged in a long perspective of pheasant curries, and I must confess that when the prospect faded I felt a little dismal. To a traveller who carries no foreign food, it makes a great difference to get a nice, hot, stimulating dish, even though it is served in the pot it is cooked in, after a ten hours cold ride. To my surprise I was never without curry for dinner, and though before the accident I had only cold rice for tiffin, after it I was never without something hot. The descent of Ankil Jung is very grand. The road leads into a wide valley with a fine stream, one side of which looks as if the mountains had dumped down all their available stones upon it, while the other is rich alluvial soil. Gold washing is carried on to a great extent along this stream, which is a tributary of the Taidong, and some of the workings show more care and method than usual, being pits neatly lined with stone in their upper parts. Eighty cents per day is the average earning of a gold seeker there. This valley terminates in pretty, broken country, with fine mountain views and picturesque cliffs along the river, on which the dark blue gloom of pines was lighted by the fading scarlet of the maple, and crimson streaks of the Amelopsis Vaichii brightened the russet into which the countless trailers which draped the rocks had passed. The increased fertility of the soil was denoted by the number of villages and hamlets on the road, and foot passengers in twos and threes gave something of life and movement. But it was remarkable that so soon after the harvest, and when the roads were in their best condition, there was no goods in transit, except such local productions as paper and tobacco, no strings of porters or ponies carrying goods into the interior from Pyongyang, no evidence of trade but that given by the peddlers going the round of the market places. Along that road and elsewhere near the villages, there are tall poles branching at the top into a V, which are erected in the belief that they will guard the inhabitants from cholera and other pestilences. On that day's journey, at a crossroad, a small log with several holes like those of a mouse trap, one of them plugged doubly with bungs of wood, was lying on the path, and the mapu were careful to step over it and lead their ponies over it, though it might easily have been avoided. Into the bunked hole the mutang or sorceress, by her arts, had inveigled a demon which was causing sickness in a family, and had corked him up. It is proper for passers-by to step over the log. At nightfall it is buried. That afternoon's ride was through extremely attractive country, small valley basins of rich stoneless soil, with brown hamlets nestling round them in calm, pine-sheltered folds of hills, which though not high, are shapely, and were etherealized into purple beauty by the sinking sun, which turned the lake-like expanse of the Tai Dong at Mu Chin Tai, the beautifully situated halting place for the night, into a sheet of gold. With a splendid climate, an abundant but not superabundant rainfall, a fertile soil, 
a measure of freedom from civil war and robber bands, the Koreans ought to be a happy and fairly prosperous people. If squeezing, yamen runners and their exactions, and certain malign practices of officials can be put down with a strong hand, and the land tax is fairly levied and collected, and law becomes an agent for protection rather than an instrument of injustice, I see no reason why the Korean peasant should not be as happy and industrious as the Japanese peasant. But these are great ifs. Security for the gains of industry, from whatever quarter it comes, will, I believe, transform the limp apathetic native. Such ameliorations as have been made are owed to Japan, but she had not a free hand, and she was too inexperienced in the role which she undertook, and I believe honestly, to play, to produce a harmonious working scheme of reform. Besides, the men through whom any such scheme must be carried out are nearly universally corrupt, both by tradition and habit. Reform was jerky and piecemeal, and Japan irritated the people by meddlesomeness in small matters and suggested interferences with national habits, giving the impression, which I found prevailing everywhere, that her object is to denationalize the Koreans for purposes of her own. Travelers are much impressed with the laziness of the Koreans, but after seeing their energy and industry in Russian Manchuria, their thrift and the abundant and comfortable furnishings of their houses, I greatly doubt whether it is to be regarded as a matter of temperament. Every man in Korea knows that poverty is his best security, and that anything he possesses beyond that which provides himself and his family with food and clothing is certain to be taken from him by voracious and corrupt officials. It is only when the exactions of officials become absolutely intolerable and encroach upon his means of providing the necessaries of life that he resorts to the only method of redress in his power, which has a sort of counterpart in China. This consists of driving out, and occasionally in killing, the obnoxious and intolerable magistrate, or, as in a case which lately gained much notoriety, roasting his favorite secretary on a woodpile. The popular outburst, though under unusual provocation it may culminate in deeds of regrettable violence, is usually founded on right, and is an effective protest. Among the modes of squeezing are forced labor, doubling or trebling the amount of a legitimate tax, exacting bribes in cases of legitation, forced loans, etc. If a man is reported to have saved a little money, an official asks for the loan of it. If it is granted, the lender frequently never sees principal or interest. If it is refused, he is arrested, thrown into prison on some charge invented for his destruction, and beaten until either he or his relations for him produce the sum demanded. To such an extent are these demands carried, that in northern Korea, where the winters are fairly severe, the peasants, when the harvest has left them with a few thousand cash, put them in a hole in the ground, and pour water into it, the frozen mass which results then being earthed over when it is fairly safe both from officials and thieves. End of section 30 Section 31 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avahi in May 2021. Chapter 29. Social Position of Women. Muchin Tai is a beautifully situated village and has something of a look of comfort. Up to that point, small boats can come up at all seasons, but there is almost no trade. The Taidong expands into a broad sheet of water, on which the hills descend abruptly. There is a ferry, and we drove our ponies into the ferry boat and yelled for the ferryman. 
After a time he appeared on the top of the bank, but absolutely declined to take us over for any money. He would have nothing to do with a foreigner, he said, and he would not be implicated with a Japanese. So we put ourselves across, and the Mapu was so angry that they threw his poles into the river. Passing through very pretty country, and twice crossing the Tai Dong, we halted at the town of Sun Chon, a magistracy with a deplorably ruinous yamen. All these official buildings have seen better days. Their courts are spacious, and the double-roofed gateways, with their drum towers, as well as the central hall of the yamen, still retain a certain look of stateliness, though paint, lacquer, and gilding have long ago disappeared from the elaborately arranged beams and carved wood of the roofs, and the fretwork screening the interiors is always shabby and broken. About the Sunchon Yamen and all others, there are crowds of runners, writers, soldiers in coarse ragged uniforms, young men of the Yangban class in spotless white garments, lounging or walking with the swinging gait befitting their position, while the decayed and forlorn rooms in the courtyard are filled with petty officials, smoking long pipes and playing cards. To judge from the crowds of attendants, the walking hither and thither, the hurrying in various directions with manuscripts, and the din of drums and fifes when the great gate is open and closed, one would think that nothing less than the business of an empire was transacted within the ruinous portals. Soldiers, writers, yamen runners, and men of the yangban and literary classes combined with the loafers of the town to compose a crowd which, by its buzzing and shouting, and tearing off the paper from my latticed door, gave me a fatiguing and hideous two hours, a Korean crowd being only unbearable when it is led by men of the literary class, who, as in China, indulge in every sort of vulgar impertinence. Eventually I was smuggled into the women's apartments, where I was victimized in other ways by insatiable curiosity. The women of the lower classes in Korea are ill-bred and unmannerly, far removed from the gracefulness of the same class in Japan or the reticence and kindliness of the Chinese peasant women. Their clothing is extremely dirty, as if the men had a monopoly of their ceaseless laundry work, which everywhere goes on far into the night. Every brookside has its laundresses squatting on flat stones, dipping the soiled clothes in the water, lying them on flat stones in tightly rolled bundles and beating them with flat paddles, a previous process consisting of steeping them in a lay made of wood ashes. Bleached under the brilliant sun and very slightly glazed with rice starch, after beaten for a length of time with short quick taps on a wooden roller with club-shaped laundry sticks, Common white cotton looks like dull white satin, and has a dazzling whiteness which always reminds me of St. Mark's words concerning the raiment at the transfiguration, so as no fuller on earth can white them. This wearing of white clothes, and especially of white wadded clothes in winter, entails very severe and incessant labor on the women. The coats have to be unpicked and put together again each time they are washed, and though some of the long seams are often joined with paste, there is still much sewing to be done. Besides this, the Korean peasant woman makes all the clothing of the household, does all the cooking, husks and cleans rice with a heavy pestle and mortar, carries heavy loads to market on her head, draws water, in remote districts works in the fields, rises early and takes rest late, spins and weaves, and as a rule has many children, who are not weaned till the age of three. The peasant woman may be said to have no pleasures. She is nothing but a drudge, till she can transfer some of the drudgery to her daughter-in-law. At thirty she looks fifty, and at forty is frequently toothless. Even the love of personal adornment fades out of her life at a very early age. 
Beyond the daily routine of life, it is probable that her thoughts never stray except to the demons, who are supposed to people earth and air, and whom it is her special duty to propitiate. It is really difficult to form a general estimate of the position of women in Korea. Absolute seclusion is the inflexible rule among the upper classes. The ladies have their own courtyards and apartments, towards which no windows from the men's apartments must look. No allusion must be made by a visitor to the females of the household. Inquiries after their health would be a gross breach of etiquette, and politeness requires that they should not be supposed to exist. Women do not receive any intellectual training, and in every class are regarded as being of a very inferior order. Nature having in the estimation of the Korean man, who holds a sort of dual philosophy, marked woman as his inferior, the youth's primer, historical summaries, and the little learning impress this view upon him in the schools, and as he begins to mix with men, this estimate of women receives daily corroboration. The seclusion of women was introduced five centuries ago by the present dynasty, in a time of great social corruption, for the protection of the family, and has probably been continued, not, as a Korean frankly told Mr. Heber Jones, because men distrust their wives, but because they distrust each other, and with good reason, for the immorality of the cities and of the upper classes almost exceeds belief. Thus, all young women, and all older women except those of the lowest class, are secluded within the inner courts of the houses by a custom which has more than the force of law. To go out suitably concealed at night, or on occasions when it is necessary to travel or to make a visit, in a rigidly closed chair, are the only outings of a Korean woman of the middle and upper classes, and the low-class woman only goes out for purposes of work. The murdered queen told me, in allusion to my own Korean journeys, that she knew nothing of Korea, or even of the capital, except on the route of the Kurdong. Daughters have been put to death by their fathers, wives by their husbands, and women have even committed suicide, according to Dalit, when strange men, whether by accident or design, have even touched their hands, and quite lately a serving woman gave as her reason for remissness in attempting to save her mistress, who perished in a fire, that in the confusion a man had touched the lady, making her not worth saving. The law may not enter the women's apartments. A noble hiding himself in his wife's rooms cannot be seized for any crime except that of rebellion. A man wishing to repair his roof must notify his neighbours, lest by any chance he should see any of their women. After the age of seven, boys and girls part company, and the girls are rigidly secluded, seeing none of the male sex except their fathers and brothers until the date of marriage, after which they can only see their own and their husband's near male relations. Girl children, even among the very poor, are so successfully hidden away that in somewhat extensive Korean journeys I never saw one girl who looked above the age of six, except hanging listlessly about in the women's rooms, and the brightness which girl life contributes to social existence is unknown in the country. But I am far from saying that the women fret and groan under this system, or crave for the freedom which European women enjoy. Seclusion is the custom of centuries. Their idea of liberty is peril, and I quite believe that they think that they are closely guarded because they are valuable chattels. One intelligent woman, when I pressed her hard to say what they thought of our customs in the matter, replied, We think that your husbands don't care for you very much. Concubinage is a recognized institution, but not a respected one. The wife or mother of a man not infrequently selects the concubine, who in many cases is looked upon by the wife as a proper appendage of her husband's means or position, much as a carriage or a butler might be with us. 
The offspring in these cases are under a serious social stigma, and until lately have been excluded from some desirable positions. Legally, the Korean is a strict monogamist, and even when a widower marries again, and there are children by the second marriage, those of the first wife retain special rights. There are no native schools for girls, and though women of the upper classes learn to read the native script, the number of Korean women who can read is estimated at two in a thousand. It appears that a philosophy largely imported from China, superstitions regarding demons, the education of men, illiteracy, a minimum of legal rights and inexorable custom have combined to give woman as low a status in civilized Korea as in any of the barbarous countries in the world. Yet there is no doubt that the Korean woman, in addition to being a born intrigant, exercises a certain direct influence, especially as mother and mother-in-law, and in the arrangement of marriages. Her rights are few, and depend on custom rather than law. She now possesses the right of remarriage, and that of remaining unmarried till she is sixteen, and she can refuse permission to her husband for his concubines to occupy the same house with herself. She is powerless to divorce her husband. Conjugal fidelity, typified by the goose, the symbolic figure at a wedding, being a feminine virtue solely. Her husband may cast her off for seven reasons. Incurable disease, theft, childlessness, infidelity, jealousy, incompatibility with her parents-in-law, and a quarrelsome disposition. She may be sent back to her father's house for any one of these causes. It is believed, however, that desertion is far more frequent than divorce. By custom rather than law she has certain recognized rights as to the control of children, redress in case of damage, etc. Domestic happiness is a thing she does not look for. The Korean has a house, but no home. The husband has his life apart. Common ties of friendship and external interest are not known. His pleasure is taken in company with male acquaintances and gesang, and the marriage relationship is briefly summarized in the remark of a Korean gentleman in conversation with me on the subject. We marry our wives, but we love our concubines. End of section 31「Section 32 of Korea and her neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May 2021. Chapter 30 Exorcists and Dancing Women. At Cha San, a magistracy, we rejoined the road from which we had diverged on the northward journey. It is a quiet, decayed place, though in a good agricultural country. As I had been there before, the edge of curiosity was blunted, and there was no mobbing. The people gave a distressing account of their sufferings from the Chinese soldiers, who robbed them unscrupulously, took what they wanted without paying, and maltreated the women. The Koreans deserted, through fright, the adjacent ferry village of O Ching Gang, where we previously crossed the Taidong, and it was held by fifty-three Chinese, being an important post. Two Japanese scouts appeared on the other side of the river, fired, and the Chinese detachment broke and fled. At Cha San, as elsewhere, the people expressed intense hatred of the Japanese, going so far as to say that they would not leave one of them alive, but, as in all other places, they bore unwilling testimony to the good conduct of the soldiers and the regularity with which the commissariat paid for supplies. The Japanese detachments were being withdrawn from the posts along that road, and we passed several well-equipped detachments, always preceded by bulls loaded with red blankets. The men were dressed in heavy grey ulsters with deep fur-lined collars and had very thick felt gloves. They marched as if on parade, 
and their officers were remarkable for their smartness. When they halted for dinner, they found everything ready, and had nothing to do but stack their arms and eat. The peasant women went on with their avocations as usual. In that district, and in the region about Tok Chon, the women seclude themselves in monstrous hats, like our wicker garden sentry boxes, but without bottoms. These extraordinary coverings are seven feet long, five broad, and three deep, and shroud the figure from head to foot. Heavy rain fell during the night, and though the following day was beautiful, the road was a deep quagmire, so infamously bad that when only two and a half hours from Pyongyang, we had to stop at the wayside inn of Anjing Miryok, where I slept in a granary only screened from the stable by a bamboo mat, and had the benefit of the squealing and vindictive sounds which accompanied numerous abortive fights. If possible, the next day exceeded its predecessors in beauty, and though the drawbacks of Korean travelling are many, this journey had been so bright and so singularly prosperous, except for Im's accident, which, however, brought out some of the best points of Korean character, that I was even sorry to leave the miserable little hostelry and conclude the expedition, and part with the Mapu, who throughout had behaved extremely well. The next morning, crossing the battlefield once more, and passing through the desolations which war had wrought, I reached my old, cold, but comparatively comfortable quarters at Pyongyang, where I remained for six days. While the river remained open, a small Korean steamer of uncertain habits, the Haryong, plied nominally between Pyongyang and Chemulpo, but actually ran from Posan, a point about sixty li lower down the Taitong, which above it is too shallow and full of sandbanks for vessels of any draught, necessitating the transshipment of all goods not brought up by junks of small tonnage. There was, however, no telegraph between Posan and Pyongyang. No one knew when the steamer arrived except by cargo coming up the river, and she only remained a few hours, so that my visit to Pyongyang was agitated by the fear of losing her and having to make a long land journey when time was precious. There was no Korean post, and the Japanese military post and telegraph office absolutely refused to carry messages or letters for civilians. Wild rumors, of which there were a goodly crop every hour, were the substitute for news. A subject of special interest and inquiry at Pyongyang was mission work as carried on by American missionaries. At Seoul, it is far more difficult to get into touch with it, as, being older, it has naturally more of religious conventionality. But I will take this opportunity of saying that longer and more intimate acquaintance only confirmed the high opinion I early formed of the large body of missionaries in Seoul, of their earnestness and devotion to their work, of the energetic, hopeful, and patient spirit in which it is carried on, of the harmony prevailing among the different denominations, and the cordial and sympathetic feeling towards the Koreans. The interest of many of the missionaries in Korean history, folklore, and customs, as evidenced by the pages of the valuable monthly, the Korean Repository, is also very admirable, and a traveller in Korea must apply to them for information vainly sought elsewhere. Christian missions were unsuccessful in Pyongyang. It was a very rich and very immoral city. More than once it turned out some of the missionaries and rejected Christianity with much hostility. Strong antagonism prevailed. The city was thronged with gesang, courtesans and sorcerers, and was notorious for its wealth and infamy. The Methodist mission was broken up for a time, and in six years the Presbyterians only numbered twenty-eight converts. Then came the war, the destruction of Pyongyang, its desertion by its inhabitants, the ruin of its trade, the reduction of its population from sixty thousand or seventy thousand to fifteen thousand, and the flight of the few Christians. 
Since the war, there had been a very great change. There had been 28 baptisms, and some of the most notorious evil livers among the middle classes, men shunned by other men for their exceeding wickedness, were leading pure and righteous lives. There were 140 catechumens under instruction, and subject to a long period of probation before receiving baptism, and the temporary church, though enlarged during my absence, was so overcrowded that many of the worshippers were compelled to remain outside. The offertories were liberal. Footnote. The Soul Christian News, a paper recently started, gave its readers an account of the Indian famine, with the result that the Christians in the magistracy of Changyang raised among themselves $84 for the sufferers in a land they had hardly heard of, some of the women sending their solid silver rings to be turned into cash. In Seoul, the native Presbyterian churches gave $80 to the same fund, of which $20 were collected by a new congregation organized entirely by Koreans. I am under the impression that the liberality of the Korean Christians, in proportion to their means, far exceeds our own. End footnote. In the dilapidated extramural premises occupied by the missionaries, 30 men were living for 21 days, two from each of 15 villages, all convinced of the truth of Christianity and earnestly receiving instruction in Christian fact and doctrine. They were studying for six hours daily with teachers, and for a far longer time amongst themselves, and had meetings for prayer, singing, and informal talk each evening. I attended three of these, and as Mr. Moffat interpreted for me, I was placed in touch with much of what was unusual and interesting, and learned more of missions in their earlier stage than anywhere else. Besides the thirty men from the villages, the Christians and catechumens from the city crowded the room and doorways. Two missionaries sat on the floor at one end of the room with a kerosene lamp mounted securely on two wooden pillows in front of them. Then there were a few candles on the floor, centers of closely packed groups. Hymns were howled in many keys to familiar tunes, several Koreans prayed, bowing their foreheads to the earth in reverence, after which some gave accounts of how the gospel reached their villages, chiefly through visits from the few Pyongyang Christians who were scattered abroad, and then two men who seemed very eloquent as well as fluent, and riveted the attention of all, gave narratives of two other men who they believed were possessed with devils, and said the devils had been driven out a few months previously by united prayer, and that the foul spirits were adjured in the name of Jesus to come out, and that the men trembled and turned cold as the devils left them, never to return, and that both became Christians along with many who saw them. A good many men came from distant villages one afternoon to ask for Christian teaching, and in the evening one after another got up and told how a refugee from Pyongyang had come to his village and had told them that they were both wicked and foolish to worship demons, and that they were wrongdoers, and that there is a Lord of Heaven who judges wrongdoing, but that He is as loving as any father, and that they did not know what to think, but that in some places twenty and more were meeting daily to worship, the highest, and that many of the women had buried the demon fetishes, and that they wanted someone to go and teach them how to worship the true God. A young man told how his father, nearly eighty years old, had met Mr. Moffat by the roadside, and hearing from him some good things, had gone home saying he had heard good news, great news, and had got the books, and that he had become a Christian and lived a good life, and had called his neighbours together to hear the news, and would not rest till his son had come to be taught in the good news, and take back a teacher. An elderly man who had made a good living by sorcery came and gave Mr. Moffat the instruments of his trade, saying he had served devils all his life, but now he knew that they were wicked spirits and he was serving the true God. 
On the same afternoon, four requests for Christian teaching came to the missionaries, each signed by from fifteen to forty men. At all these evening meetings the room was crammed within and without by men, reverent and earnest in manner, some of whom had been shunned for their wickedness even in a city, the smoke of which, in her palmy days, was said to go up like the smoke of Sodom, but who, transformed by a power outside themselves, were then leading exemplary lives. There were groups in the dark, groups round the candles on the floor, groups in the doorways, and every face was aglow except that of poor, bewildered Im. One old man, with his forehead in the dust, prayed like a child that, as the letter bearing to New York an earnest request for more teachers was on its way, the wind and sea might waft it favourably, and that when it was read, the eyes of the foreigners might be open to see the sore need of people in a land where no one knows anything, and where all believe in devils and are dying in the dark. As I looked upon those lighted faces, wearing an expression strongly contrasting with the dull, dazed look of apathy, which is characteristic of the Korean, it was impossible not to recognize that it was the teaching of the apostolic doctrines of sin, judgment to come, and divine love which had brought about such results, all the more remarkable because, according to the missionaries, a large majority of those who had renounced demon worship and were living in the fear of the true God had been attracted to Christianity in the first instance by the hope of gain. This, and almost unvarying testimony to the same effect, confirm me in the opinion that when people talk of nations craving for the gospel, stretching out pleading hands for it, or a thirst for God, or longing for the living waters, they are using words which in that connection have no meaning. That there are seekers after righteousness here and there, I do not doubt, but I believe that the one craving of the Far East is for money, that unrest is only in the East a synonym for poverty, and that the spiritual instincts have yet to be created. On the Sunday I went with Dr. Scranton of Seoul to the first regular service ever held for women in Pyongyang. There were a number present, all demon worshippers, some of them attracted by the sight of a foreign woman. It was impossible to have a formal service with people who had not the most elementary ideas of God, of prayer, of moral evil, and of good. It was not possible to secure their attention. They were destitute of religious ideas. An elderly matron, who acted as a sort of spokeswoman, said, They thought perhaps God is a big demon, and he might help them to get back their lost goods. That service was mission work in its earliest stage. On returning from a service in the afternoon where there were crowds of bright, intelligent-looking worshippers, we came upon one of the most important ceremonies connected with the popular belief in demons, the exorcism of an evil spirit which was supposed to be the cause of a severe illness. Never by night or day on my two visits to Pyongyang had I been out of hearing of the roll of the sorcerer's drum with the loud vibratory clash of cymbals as an intermittent accompaniment. Such sounds attracted us to the place of exorcism. In a hovel with an open door a man lay very ill. The space in front was matted and enclosed by low screens, within which were Korean tables loaded with rice cakes, boiled rice, stewed chicken, sprouted beans, and other delicacies. In this open space squatted three old women, two of whom beat large drums, shaped like hourglasses, while the third clashed large cymbals. Facing them was the mutang or sorceress, dressed in rose-pink silk, with a buff gauze robe, with its sleeves trailing much on the ground, over it. Pieces of paper resembling the Shinto Gohei decorated her hair, and a curious cap of buff gauze with red patches upon it completed the not inelegant costume. She carried a fan, 
but it was only used occasionally in one of the dances. She carried over her left shoulder a stick, painted with bands of bright colours, from which hung a gong which she beat with a similar stick, executing at the same time a slow, rhythmic movement accompanied by a chant. From time to time one of the ancient drummers gathered on one plate pieces from all the others, and scattered them to the four winds for the spirits to eat, invoking them, saying, Do not trouble this house any more, and we will again appease you by offerings. The Mutang is, of course, according to the belief of those who seek her services, possessed by a powerful demon, and by means of her incantations might induce this demon to evict the one which was causing the sickness by aiding her exorcisms, but where the latter is particularly obstinate, she may require larger fees and more offerings in order that she may use incantations for bringing to her aid a yet more powerful demon than her own. The exorcism lasted fourteen hours, until four the next morning, when the patient began to recover. A crowd, chiefly composed of women and children, stood round the fence, the children imbibing devilry from their infancy. I was not at a regular inn in Pyongyang, but at a broker's house, with a yard to myself nominally, but which was by no means private. Im generally, and not roughly, requested the people to move on, but he made two exceptions, one being in favour of a madwoman of superior appearance and apparel, who haunted me on my second visit, hanging about the open front of my room, and following me to the mission house and elsewhere. She said that I was her grandmother, and that she must go with me everywhere, and, like many mad people, she had an important and mysterious communication to make, which, for obvious reasons, never reached me. She was the concubine of a late governor of the city, and not having escaped before its capture, went mad from horror at seeing the Chinese spitted on the bayonets of the Japanese. She carried a long bodkin and went through distressing pantomimes of running people through with it. The other exception was in favour of Gesang, upon whose presence Im looked quite approvingly, and evidently thought I did. Pyongyang has always been famous for the beauty and accomplishments of its Gesang, singing and dancing girls, resembling in many respects the geishas of Japan, but correctly speaking, they mostly belong to the government and are supported by the Korean treasury. At the time of my two first sojourns in Seoul, about seventy of them were attached to the royal palace. They were under the control of the same government department as that with which the official musicians are connected. As a poor man gifted with many sons, for whom he cannot provide, sometimes presents one to the government as a eunuch, so he may give a girl to be a gesang. The gesang are trained from a very early age in such accomplishments as other Korean women lack, and which will ensure their attractiveness, such as playing on various musical instruments, singing, dancing, reading, reciting, writing, and fancy work. As their destiny is to make time pass agreeably for men of the upper classes, this amount of education is essential, though a Korean does not care how blank and undeveloped the mind of his wife is. The Gesang are always elegantly dressed, as they were when they came to see me, even through the mud of the Pyongyang streets, and as they have not known seclusion, their manners with both sexes have a graceful ease. Their dancing, like that of most oriental countries, consists chiefly of posturing, and is said by those foreigners who have seen it, to be perfectly free from impropriety. Dr. Allen, secretary to the U.S. legation at Seoul, in a paper in the Korean Repository for 1886, describes among the dances which specially interest foreigners at the entertainments at the Royal Palace, one known as the Lotus Dance. In this he writes, A tub is brought in containing a large lotus flower just ready to burst open. Two imitation storks then come in, 
each one being a man very cleverly disguised. These birds flap their wings, snap their beaks, and dance round in admiration of the beautiful bud which they evidently intend to pluck as soon as they have enjoyed it sufficiently in anticipation. Their movements all this time are very graceful, and they come closer and closer to the flower, keeping time to the soft music. At last the proper time arrives, the flower is plucked, when, as the pink petals fall back, out steps a little gesang to the evident amazement of the birds and to the intense delight of the younger spectators. The sword and dragon dances are also extremely popular, and on great occasions the performance is never complete without throwing the ball, which consists in a series of graceful arm movements before a painted arch, after which the gesang march in procession before the king, and the successful dancers receive presents. Though the most beautiful and attractive gesang come from Pyongyang, they are found throughout the country. From the king down to the lowest official who can afford the luxury, the presence of gesang is regarded at every entertainment as indispensable to the enjoyment of the guests. They appear at official dinners at the foreign office, and at the palace are the chief entertainers, and sing and dance at the many parties which are given by Koreans at the picnic resorts near Seoul, and though attached to the prefectures and various other departments, may be hired by gentlemen to give fascination to their feasts. Their training and non-secluded position place them, however, outside of the reputable classes, and though in Japan geishas often become the wives of nobles and even of statesmen, no Korean man would dream of raising a gesang to such a position. Dr. Allen, who has had special opportunities of becoming acquainted with the inner social life of Korea, says that they are the source of much heart-burning to the legal but neglected wife, who in no case is the wife of her husband's choice, and that Korean folklore abounds with stories of discord arising in families from attachments to gesang, and of ardent and prolonged devotion on the part of young noblemen to those girls, who they are prevented from marrying by rigid custom. There is a Korean tale called The Swallow King's Rewards, in which a man is visited with the Ten Plagues of Korea for maltreating a wounded swallow, and in it Gesang are represented along with Mutang as among the ten curses of the land. Dr. Allen, to whom I owe this fact, writes, Doubtless they are so considered by many a lonely wife, as well as by the fathers who mourn to see their sons wasting their substance in riotous living, as they doubtless did themselves when they were young. The house in which I had quarters was much resorted to by merchants for whom my host transacted brokerage business, and entertainments were the order of the day. Mr. Yi was invited to dinner daily, and on the last evening entertained all who had invited him. Such meals cost per head as much as a dinner at the St. James's restaurant. Noise seems essential to these gatherings. The men shout at the top of their voices. There is an enormous amount of visiting and entertaining among men in the cities. Some public men keep open house, giving their servants as much as sixty dollars a day for the entertainment of guests. Men who are in easy circumstances go continually from one house to another to kill time. They never talk politics, it is too dangerous, but retail the latest gossip of the court or city, and the witticisms attributed to great men, and tell, hear, and invent news. The front rooms of houses in which the men live are open freely to all comers. In some circles, though it is said to a far less extent than formerly, men meet and talk over what we should call questions of literary criticism, compare poetic compositions, the ability to compose a page of poetry being the grand result of Korean education, and discuss the meaning of celebrated works all literature being in Chinese. 
the common people meet in the streets, the house fronts, and the inns. They ask each other endless questions, of a nature that we should think most impertinent, regarding each other's business, work, and money transactions, and for the latest news. It is every man's business to hear or create all the news he can. What he hears he embellishes by lies and exaggerations. Korea is the country of wild rumors. What a Korean knows, or rather hears, he tells. According to Père Dallet, he does not know the meaning of reserve, though he is utterly devoid of frankness. Men live in company in each other's houses. Domestic life is unknown. The women in the inner rooms receive female visitors, and the girl children are present. The boys, at a very early age, are removed to the men's apartments, where they learn, from the conversation they hear, that every man who respects himself must regard women with contempt. We left Pyongyang for Posan in a very small boat in which six people and their luggage were uncomfortably packed and cramped. One of the two boatmen was literally down with fever, but with one, and a strong ebb tide, we accomplished twenty miles in six hours, and were well pleased to find the Haryong lying at anchor, as we had not been able to get any definite information concerning her, and I never believed in her till I saw her. The Taidong has some historic interest, for up its broad waters sailed Kija, or Kitze, with his army of five thousand men on the way to found Pyongyang and Korean civilization, and down it fled Ki Jun, the last king of the First Dynasty, from the forces of Wei Man descending from the north. Pyongyang impressed me, as it did Consul Karls, with its natural suitability for commerce, and this Taidong, navigable up to the city for small junks, is the natural outlet for beans and cotton, some of which find their way to Nuchwang for shipment, for the rich iron ore which lies close to the river banks at Kai Chon, for the gold of Kermsan only twenty miles off, for the abounding coal of the immediate neighborhood, for the hides which are now carried on men's backs to Chemul Po, and for the products of what is said to be a considerable silk industry. In going down the river, something is seen of the original size of Pyongyang, for the earth wall on solid masonry, built, it is said, by Kitze three thousand years ago, follows the right bank of the Taidong for about four miles, before it turns away to the north, to terminate at the foot of the hill on which is the reputed grave of its builder. This extends in that direction, possibly three miles beyond the present wall. The plain through which the river runs is fertile and well cultivated, though the shining mud-flats at low tide are anything but prepossessing. Various rivers, enabling boats of light draught to penetrate the country, most of them rising in the picturesque mountain ranges which descend on the plain, specially on its western side, join the Taidong. Much had been said of the Haryong. I was told I should be all right if I could get the Haryong, that the Haryong's a most comfortable little boat, she has ten staterooms, and as we approached her in the mist, very wet and stiff from the length of time spent in a cramped position, I conjured up visions of comfort and even luxury, which were not to be realized. She was surrounded by Japanese junks, Japanese soldiers crowded her gangways, and Japanese officers were directing the loading. We hooked on to the junks and lay in the rain for an hour, nobody taking the slightest notice of us. Mr. Yi then scrambled on board, and there was another half-hour's delay, which took us into the early darkness. He reappeared, saying there was no cabin and we must go on shore. But there was no place to sleep on shore, and it was the last steamer, so I climbed on board, and Im hurried in the baggage. It was raining and blowing, and we were huddled on the wet deck like steerage passengers, 
Japanese soldiers and commissariat officers there as elsewhere in Korea, masters of the situation. Mr. Yi was frantic that he, a government official, and one from whom the Japanese had to ask a hundred favors a month, should be treated with such indignity. The vessel was hired by the Japanese commissariat department to go to Nagasaki, calling it Chemulpo, and we were really, though unintentionally, interlopers. There was truly no room for me, and the arrangement whereby I received shelter was essentially Japanese. I lived in a minute saloon with the commissariat officers, and fed precariously, Im dealing out to me, at long intervals, the remains of a curry which he had had the forethought to bring. There was a Korean purser, but the poor dazed fellow was nowhere, being totally superseded by a brisk young mannequin who, in the intervals of business, came to me, notebook in hand, that I might help him to enlarge his English vocabulary. The only sign of vitality that the limp, displaced purser showed was to exclaim with energy more than once, I hate these Japanese, they've taken our own ships. Fortunately, the sea was quite still, and the weather was dry and fine. Even Yon Yung Pa Da, a disagreeable stretch of ocean off the Wang Hai coast, was quiet. The halt of nearly a day off the new treaty port of Chin Nam Po, where the mud flats extend far out from the shore, was not disagreeable, and we reached the familiar harbour of Chemul Po by a glorious sunset on the frosty evening of the third day from Po San, the voyage in a small Asiatic transport having turned out better than could have been expected. Itinerary Seoul to Koyang, 40 li Paju, 40 li Omok, 40 li Ohurchuk-kyo, 30 li Songdo, 10 li Ohungsuk-ju, 30 li Kunko-kai, 30 li Tolmaru, 35 li anshung pa 25 li Shuohung, 30 li Hungsho wan 30 li Pongsan, 40 li Huangju, 40 li Kurmon Tari, 30 li Chidol pa pal, 40 li Pyongyang, 30 li Mori ko kai, 30 li Liangyang Chang, 30 li Cha San, 30 li Shoyang Yi, 40 li Hakkai Oil, 35 li Ka Chang, 35 li Huok Kuri, 40 li Tok Chon, 30 li Shur Chong, 30 li An Kil Yung, 20 li Shil Yi, 40 li Mo Chin Tai, 25 li Sun Chon, 35 li Cha San, 30 li Siang Yang Chon, 40 li An Chin Miryok, 30 li Pyongyang, 20 li Total land journey, 1060 li End of section 32、Section thirty three of Korea and her neighbors by Isabella Elbert. Recording by Avai in May two thousand twenty one. Chapter thirty one The Hair Cropping Edict. The year 1896 opened for Korea in a gloom as profound as that in which the previous year had closed. There were small insurrections in all quarters, various officials were killed, and some of the rebels threatened to march on the capital. Japanese influence declined, Japanese troops were gradually withdrawn from the posts they had occupied, the engagements of many of the Japanese advisers and controllers in departments expired and were not renewed. Some of the reforms instituted by Japan during the period of her ascendancy died a natural death. There was a distinctly retrograde movement, and government was disintegrating all over the land. 
The general agitation in the country and several of the more serious of the outbreaks had a cause which, while to our thinking it is ludicrous, shows as much as anything else the intense conservatism of punkok or custom which prevails among the Koreans. The cause was an attack on the top knot by a royal edict on 30th December 1895. This set the country aflame. The Koreans, who had borne on the whole quietly the ascendancy of a hated power, the murder of their queen, and the practical imprisonment of their king, found the attack on their hair more than they could stand. The top knot is more to a Korean than the queue is to a Chinese. The queue to the latter may be a sign of subjugation or of loyalty to the government, and that is all, and the small Chinese boy wears it as soon as his hair is long enough to plait. To the Korean, the top knot means nationality, antiquity, some say of five centuries, others of two thousand years. Sanctity derived from antiquity, entrance on manhood socially and legally, even though he may be a child in years, the assumption of two names by which in addition to his family name he is afterwards known, and by which he is designated on the ancestral tablets. Marriage is intimately bound up with it, as is ancestral worship, and as has been mentioned in the chapter on marriage, a Korean without a topknot, even if in middle life, can only be treated as a nameless and irresponsible boy. In a few cases, a Korean, to escape from this stage of disrespect, scrapes together enough to pay for the topknot ceremonies and the mankun, hat, and long coat, which are their sequence, though he is too poor to support a family. But the top knot, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, is only assumed on marriage, without which the wearer has the title of a half-man bestowed on him. The ceremonies at the investiture of the top knot deserve a brief notice as among the most important of the singularities of the nation. When the father and family have decided that a boy shall be invested, which in nearly all cases is on the verge of his marriage, men's clothes, the hat, mang kun, etc., are provided to the limits of the family purse, and the astrologers are consulted who choose a propitious day and hour for the ceremony, as well as the point of the compass which the chief actor is to face during its progress. The fees of the regular astrologer are very high, and in the case of the poor, the blind sorcerer is usually called in to decide on these important points. When the auspicious day and hour arrive, the family assembles, but as it is a family matter only, friends are not invited. Luck and prosperity, and a number of sons, are essential for the master of the ceremonies. If the father has been so blessed, he acts as such. If not, an old friend who has been more lucky acts for him. The candidate for the distinction and privileges of manhood is placed in the middle of the room, seated on the floor, great care being taken that he faces the point of the compass which has been designated, otherwise he would have bad luck from that day forward. With much ceremony and due deliberation, the master of the ceremonies proceeds to unwind the boy's massive plate, shaves a circular spot three inches in diameter on the crown of his head, brings the whole hair up to this point, and arranges it with strings into a firm twist from two and a half to four inches in length, which stands up from the head slightly forwards like a horn. The mankun, fillet, or crownless skull cap of horsehair gauze, coming well down over the brow, is then tied on, and so tightly as to produce a permanent groove in the skin and headaches for some time. The hat, secured by its strings, is then put on, and the long white coat, and the boy rises up a man. The new man bows to each of his relations in regular order, beginning with his grandfather, kneeling and placing his hands, palms downward, on the floor, and resting his forehead for a moment upon them. 
He then offers sacrifices to his deceased ancestors before the ancestral tablets, lighted candles in high brass candlesticks being placed on each side of the bowls of sacrificial food or fruit, and bowing profoundly, acquaints them with the important fact that he has assumed the top knot. Afterwards, he calls on the adult male friends of his family, who for the first time receive him as an equal, and at night there is a feast in his honour in his father's house, to which all the family friends who have attained to the dignity of topknots are invited. The hat is made of fine crinoline, so that the topknot may be seen very plainly through it, and weighs only an ounce and a half. It is a source of ceaseless anxiety to the Korean. If it gets wet, it is ruined, so that he seldom ventures to stir abroad without a waterproof cover for it in his capacious sleeve, and it is so easily broken and crushed, that when not in use it must be kept or carried in a wooden box, usually much decorated, as obnoxious in transit as a lady's bandbox. The keeping on the hat is a mark of respect. Court officials appear in the sovereign's presence with their hats on, and the Korean only takes it off in the company of his most intimate friends. The mankun is a fixture. The top knot is often decorated with a bead of jade, amber, or turquoise, and some of the young swells wear expensive tortoise shell combs as its ornaments. There is no other single article of male equipment that I am aware of which plays so important a part, or is regarded with such reverence, or is clung to so tenaciously, as the Korean topknot. On an institution so venerated and time-honoured, and so bound up with Korean nationality, for the Korean, though remarkably destitute of true patriotism, has a strongly national instinct, the decree of the 30th of December 1895, practically abolishing the topknot, fell like a thunderbolt. The measure had been advocated before, chiefly by Koreans who had been in America, and was known to have Japanese support, and had been discussed by the cabinet, but the change was regarded with such disgust by the nation at large that the government was afraid to enforce it. Only a short time before the decree was issued, three chief officers of the Kunren Tai entered the council chamber with drawn swords, demanding the instantaneous issue of an edict making it compulsory on every man in government employment to have his hair cropped, and the ministers, terrified for their lives, all yielded but one, and he succeeded for the time in getting the issue of it delayed till after the Queen's funeral. Very shortly afterwards, however, the king, practically a prisoner, was compelled to endorse it, and he, the crown prince, the Taiwan Kun, and the cabinet were divested of their topknots, the soldiers and police following suit. The following day the official gazette promulgated a decree, endorsed by the king, announcing that he had cut his hair short, and calling out on all his subjects, officials and common people alike, to follow his example and identify themselves with the spirit of progress which had induced His Majesty to take this step, and thus place his country on a footing of equality with the other nations of the world. The Home Office notifications were as follows. Translation the present cropping of the hair being a measure both advantageous to the preservation of health and convenient for the transaction of business, our sacred lord the king, having in view both administrative reform and national aggrandizement, has, by taking the lead in his own person, set us an example. All the subjects of Great Korea should respectfully conform to His Majesty's purpose, and the fashion of their clothing should be as set forth below. 1. During national mourning the hat and clothing should, until the expiration of the term of mourning, be white in colour as before. 2. The fillet, mankun, should be abandoned. 3. There is no objection to the adoption of foreign clothing. Signed, Yukil Chun, Acting Home Minister. 
11th moon, 15th day. Number 2. In the proclamation which His Majesty graciously issued today, 11th moon, 15th day, are words, We, in cutting our hair, are setting an example to our subjects. Do you, the multitude, identify yourselves with our design, and cause to be accomplished the great work of establishing equality with the nations of the earth? At a time of reform such as this, when we humbly peruse so spirited a proclamation, among all of us subjects of great Korea, who does not weep for gratitude and strive his utmost? Earnestly united in heart and mind, we earnestly expect a humble conformity with His Majesty's purposes of reformation. Signed, Yu Kil Chun, Acting Home Minister. 504th year since the founding of the dynasty, 11th moon, 15th day. Among the reasons which rendered the top-knot decree detestable to the people were that priests and monks, who, instead of being held in esteem, are regarded generally as a nuisance to be tolerated, wear their hair closely cropped, and the edict was believed to be an attempt instigated by Japan to compel Koreans to look like Japanese and adopt Japanese customs. So strong was the popular belief that it was to Japan that Korea owed the denationalizing order, that in the many places where there were top-knot riots, it was evidenced by overt acts of hostility to the Japanese, frequently resulting in murder. The rural districts were convulsed. Officials even of the highest rank found themselves on the horns of a dilemma. If they cut their hair, they were driven from their lucrative posts by an infuriated populace, and in several instances lost their lives, while if they retained the top knot, they were dismissed by the cabinet. In one province, on the arrival from Seoul of a newly appointed Mandarin with cropped hair, he was met by a great concourse of people ready for the worst, who informed him that they had hitherto been ruled by a Korean man and would not endure a monk magistrate, on which he prudently retired to the capital. All through the land there were top-knot complexities and difficulties. Countrymen, merchants, Christian catechists and others, who had come to Seoul on business and had been shorn, dared not risk their lives by returning to their homes. Wood and country produce did not come in, and the price of the necessaries of life rose seriously. Many men who prized the honor of entering the palace gates at the new year feigned illness, but were sent for and denuded of their hair. The click of the shears was heard at every gate in Seoul, at the palace, and at the official residences. Even servants were not exempted, and some of the foreign representatives were unable to present themselves at the palace on New Year's Day because their chairmen were unwilling to meet the shears. A father poisoned himself from grief and humiliation because his two sons had submitted to the decree. The foundations of social order were threatened when the top knot fell. People who had had their hair cropped did not dare to venture far from Seoul, lest they should be exposed to the violence of the rural population. At Chuncheon, fifty miles from the capital, when the governor tried to enforce the ordinance, the people rose en masse and murdered him and his whole establishment, afterwards taking possession of the town and surrounding country. As policemen with their shears were at the soul gates to enforce the decree on incomers, and peasants who had been cropped on arriving did not dare to return to their homes, prices rose so seriously by the middle of January 1896 that trouble in the capital was expected, and another order was issued that country folk were to be let alone at that time. Things went from bad to worse, till on the 11th of February 1896, the whole Far East was electrified by a sensational telegram. The King of Korea had escaped from his palace and is at the Russian legation. On that morning, the King and Crown Prince, in the dim daybreak, left the Kyengpok Palace in closed box chairs 
such as are used by the palace waiting women, pass through the gates without being suspected by the sentries, and reach the Russian legation, the king pale and trembling as he entered the spacious suit of apartments, which for more than a year afterwards offered him a secure asylum. The palace ladies who arranged the escape had kept their counsel well, and had caused a number of chairs to go in and out of the gates early and late during the previous week, so that the flight failed to attract any attention. As the king does much of his work at night, and retires to rest in the early morning, the ever-vigilant cabinet, his jailers, supposed him to be asleep, and it was not until several hours later that his whereabouts became known, when the organization of a new cabinet was progressing, and Korean dignitaries began to be summoned into the royal presence. The king, on gaining security, at once reassumed his long-lost prerogatives, which have never since been curbed in the slightest degree. The irredeemable orientalism of the two following proclamations, which were posted over the city within a few hours of his escape, warrants their insertion in full. Royal Proclamation Translation Alas, alas, on account of our unworthiness and maladministration, the wicked advanced and the wise retired. Of the last ten years none has passed without troubles. Some were brought on by those we had trusted as the members of the body, while others by those of our own bone and flesh. Our dynasty of five centuries has thereby been often endangered, and millions of our subjects have thereby been gradually impoverished. These facts make us blush and sweat for shame. But these troubles have been brought about through our partiality and self-will, giving rise to rascality and blunders leading to calamities. All have been our own fault from the first to the last. Fortunately, through loyal and faithful subjects rising up in righteous efforts to remove the wicked, there is a hope that the tribulations experienced may invigorate the state, and that calm may return after the storm. This accords with the principle that human nature will have freedom after a long pressure, and that the ways of heaven bring success after reverses. We shall endeavour to be merciful. No pardon, however, shall be extended to the principal traitors concerned in the affairs of July 1894 and of October 1895. Capital punishment should be their due, thus venting the indignation of men and gods alike. But to all the rest, officials or soldiers, citizens or coolies, a general amnesty, free and full, is granted, irrespective of the degree of their offences. Reform your hearts, ease your minds, go about your business, public or private, as in times past. As to the cutting of the top knots, what can we say? Is it such an urgent matter? The traitors, by using force and coercion, brought about the affair. That this measure was taken against our will is, no doubt, well known to all. Nor is it our wish that the conservative subjects throughout the country, moved to righteous indignation, should rise up, as they have, circulating false rumours, causing death and injury to one another, until the regular troops had to be sent to suppress the disturbances by force. The traitors indulged their poisonous nature in everything. Fingers and hairs would fail to count their crimes. The soldiers are our children, so are the insurgents. Cut any of the ten fingers and one would cause as much pain as another. Fighting long continued would pour out blood and heap up corpses, hindering communications and traffic. Alas, if this continues, the people will all die. The mere contemplation of such consequences provokes our tears and chills our heart. We desire that as soon as orders arrive, the soldiers should return to Seoul and the insurgents to their respective places and occupations. As to the cutting of top knots, no one shall be forced as to dress and hats. Do as you please. 
the evils now afflicting the people shall be duly attended to by the government. This is our own word of honour. Let all understand. By order of His Majesty. Signed, Pak Chung Yang, Acting Home and Prime Minister. Eleventh day, second moon, first year of Konyang. Proclamation to the Soldiers On account of the unhappy fate of our country, traitors have made trouble every year. Now we have a document informing us of another conspiracy. We have therefore come to the Russian legation. The representatives of different countries have all assembled. Soldiers, come and protect us. You are our children. The troubles of the past were due to the crimes of chief traitors. You are all pardoned and shall not be held answerable. Do your duty and be at ease. When you meet the chief traitors, that is, Cho Hui Yen, Wu Pom Sun, Yi Tu Huang, Yi Pom Nai, Yi Chin Ho, and Kon Yong Chin, cut off their heads at once and bring them. You, soldiers, attend us at the Russian legation. Eleventh day, second moon, first year of Konyang. Royal Sign. Following on this, on the same day, and while thousands of people were reading the repeal of the hair-cropping order, those of the cabinet who could be caught were arrested and beheaded in the street. The prime minister, who had kept his place in several cabinets, and the Minister of Agriculture and Commerce. The mob, infuriated, and regarding the Premier as the author of the downfall of the top-knot, gave itself up to unmitigated savagery, insulting and mutilating the dead bodies in a manner absolutely fiendish. Another of the cabinet was rescued by Japanese soldiers, and the other traitorous members ran away. A cabinet, chiefly new, was installed, prison doors were opened, and the inmates, guilty and innocent alike, were released. Strict orders were given by the king that the Japanese were to be protected, one having already fallen a victim to the fury of the populace, and before night fell on Seoul, much of the work of the previous six months had been undone, and the top knot had triumphed. Footnote. When I last saw the king, this national adornment seemed to have resumed its former proportions. End footnote. How the Korean king, freed from the strong influence of the queen and the brutal control of his mutinous officers, used his freedom, need not be told here. It was supposed just after his escape that he would become a mere tool in the hands of the Russian minister, but so far was this from being the case that before a year had passed, it was greatly desired by many that Mr. Weber would influence him against the bad in statecraft and in favour of the good, and the cause of his determination not to bias the king in any way remains a mystery to this day. The roads which led to the Russian legation were guarded by Korean soldiers, but eighty Russian marines were quartered in the compound and held the gates, while a small piece of artillery was very much on evidence on the terrace below the king's windows. He had an abundant entourage. For some months the cabinet occupied the ballroom, and on the terrace and round the king's apartments there were always numbers of court officials and servants of all grades, eunuchs, palace women, etc., while the favourites, the ladies Om and Pak, who assisted in his escape, were constantly to be seen in his vicinity. Reveling in the cheerfulness and security of his surroundings, the king shortly built a palace, to which he removed in the spring of 1897, surrounding the tablet house of the queen, and actually in Chongdong, the European quarter, its grounds adjoining those of the English and U.S. legations. To the security of this tablet house, the remains of the queen, supposed to consist only of the bones of one finger, were removed on a lucky day, chosen by the astrologers with much pomp. On this occasion, a guard of eighty Russian soldiers occupied a position close to the royal tent, 
not far from one in which the foreign representatives, with the noteworthy exception of the Japanese envoy, were assembled. Rolled-up scroll portraits of the five immediate ancestors of the king, each enclosed in a large oblong palaquin of gilded fretwork, and preceded by a crowd of officials in old court costume, filed past the royal tent, where the king did obeisance, and the Russian guard presented arms. This was only the first part of the ceremony. Later, a colossal catafalque, containing the fragmentary remains of the murdered queen, was dragged through the streets from the Kengpok Palace by seven hundred men in sackcloth, preceded and followed by a crowd of court functionaries, also in mourning, and escorted by Korean drilled troops. The king and the crown prince received the procession at the gate of the new Kyeng Wun Palace, and the hearse, after being hauled up to the end of a long platform outside the spirit shrine, was tracked by ropes, for no hand might touch it, to the interior, where it rested under a canopy of white silk, and for more than a year received the customary rites and sacrifices from the bereaved husband and son. The large crowd in the streets was orderly and silent. The ceremony was remarkable, both for the revival of picturesque detail and of practices which it was supposed had become obsolete, such as the supporting of officials on their ponies by retainers, or when on foot by having their arms propped up. In July 1896, Mr. J. Mlevy Brown, LLD, Chief Commissioner of Customs, received by royal decree the absolute control of all payments out of the treasury, and having gained considerable insight into the complexities of financial corruption, addressed himself in earnest to the reform of abuses, and with most beneficial results. In September, a council of state of fourteen members was substituted for the cabinet of ministers organized under Japanese auspices, a change which was to some extent a return to old methods. Many of the attempts made by the Japanese during their ascendancy to reform abuses were allowed to lapse. The country was unsettled, a righteous army having replaced the Tonghaks. The minister of the household and other royal favorites resumed the practice of selling provincial and other posts in a most unblushing manner after the slight checks which had been imposed on this most deleterious custom and the sovereign himself, whose civil list is ample, appropriated public monies for his own purposes, while, finding himself personally safe and free from Japanese or other control, he reverted in many ways to the traditions of his dynasty, and in spite of attempted checks upon his authority, reigned as an absolute monarch, his edict's law, his will absolute. Meanwhile, Japan was gradually effacing herself, or being effaced, and whatever influence she lost in Korea, Russia gained, but the advantages of the change were not obvious. End of section 33。section 34 of Korea and her neighbors by Isabella L. Bird。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May 2021. Chapter 32. The Reorganized Korean Government. Footnote. The chapters on the Reorganized Korean Government, Education, Trade and Finance, and Demonism are intended to aid in the intelligent understanding of those which precede them. The reader who wishes to go into the subject of the old and reorganized systems of Korean government will find a mass of curious and deeply interesting detail in a volume entitled Korean Government by W. H. Wilkinson, Esquire, lately Her British Majesty's Acting Vice Consul at Chemul Po, published by the Statistical Department of the Chinese Imperial Maritime Customs at Shanghai in March 1897. To it I am very greatly indebted. End footnote. The old system of government in Korea, 
which, with but a few alterations and additions, prevailed from the founding of the present dynasty until the second half of 1894, was modelled on that of the Ming emperors of China. The king was absolute, as well in practice as in theory, but to assist him in governing there was a Oi Chieng Pu, commonly translated cabinet, composed of a so-called premier and senior and junior ministers of state, under whom were senior and junior chief secretaries and senior and junior assistant secretaries, with certain minor functionaries. The government being conducted through boards as in China, that is, civil office, revenue, ceremonies, war, punishment, and works, to which were added after the opening of the country to foreigners, foreign and home offices. During the present reign, the Home Office, under the presidency of a powerful and ambitious cousin of the Queen, Ming Yeng Chun, began to draw to itself all administrative power, while Her Majesty's and his relations, who occupied the chief positions throughout the country, fleeced the people without restraint. Of the remaining offices, which were seated in the metropolis, the chief were the Correctional Tribunal, an office of the first rank which took cognizance of the offences of officials, and the prefecture of Seoul, which had charge of all municipal matters. Korea was divided into eight provinces, each under the control of a governor, aided by a civil and military secretary. Magistrates of different grades, according to the size of the magistracies, were appointed under him. Five fortress cities, however, being independent of provincial jurisdiction. The principal tax, the land tax, was paid in kind, and the local governments had very considerable control over the local revenues. There were provincial military and naval forces with large staffs of officers, and boards, offices and departments innumerable under government, each with its legion of supernumeraries. The country was eaten up by officialism. It is not only that abuses without number prevailed, but the whole system of government was an abuse, a sea of corruption without a bottom or a shore, an engine of robbery, crushing the life out of all industry. Offices and justice were bought and sold like other commodities, and government was fast decaying, the one principle which survived being its right to prey on the governed. The new order of things, called by the Japanese the Reformation, dates from the forcible occupation of the Kienpok Palace by Japanese troops on the 23rd of July, 1894. The constitutional changes which have subsequently been promulgated, though not always carried out, were initiated by the Japanese minister in Seoul and reduced to detail by the Japanese advisers, who shortly arrived, and Japan is entitled to the credit of having attempted to cope with and remedy the manifold abuses of the Korean system, and of having bequeathed to the country the lines on which reforms are now being carried out. It was natural, and is certainly not blameworthy, that the Japanese had in view the assimilation of Korean polity to that of Japan. To bring about the desired reorganization, Mr. Otori, at that time the Japanese minister, induced the king to create an assembly, which, whatever its ultimate destiny, was to form meanwhile a department for the discussion of all matters grave and trivial within the realm. The prime minister was its president, and the number of its members was limited to 20 councillors. A noteworthy feature in connection with it was that it invited suggestions from outsiders in the form of written memoranda. It met for the first time on the 30th of July, 1894, and for the last on the 29th of October of the same year. It was found impossible, either by payment or royal orders, to secure a quorum, and after the Vice Minister of Justice, one of the few councillors who took an active part in the proceedings, was murdered two days after the last meeting, as was believed by an agent of the reactionary party, it practically expired, 
and was dissolved by royal decree on the 17th of December 1894, and the reconstituted Privy Council took its place. Those of its resolutions, however, which had received the royal assent, became law, and unless repealed or superseded, are still binding. These resolutions appeared in the Government Gazette, an institution of very old standing, imitated, like most things else, from China. This was prepared by the Court of Transmission, a palace department, the senior members of which formed the channel of communication between the king and the official body at large, and who, while other high officials could only reach the throne by means of personal memorials or written memoranda, were privileged to address the king viva voce, and through whom as a rule his commands were issued. Each day this department collected the various memoranda and memorials, the royal replies, and the lists of appointments, copies of which, when edited by it, formed the Gazette, which was furnished in manuscript to officials throughout the kingdom. The royal edicts, when published in this paper, became law in Korea. In July 1894, Mr. Ottori made the useful innovation of publishing the Gazette in clear type, and in the following January it appeared in a mixture of Chinese hieroglyphs and En Mun, the vulgar script of Korea, and became intelligible to the common people. No special change was made at that time, except that the resolutions of the deliberative assembly were included in it. Later changes have assimilated it farther to the Government Gazette of Japan, and it has gained rather than lost in importance. Gradually, a diminution of the power of the Court of Transmission began to show itself. Its name was changed to the Receiving Office, and members of the Cabinet and the Correctional Tribunal began to enjoy direct access to the King. In April 1895, a farther change in a Japanese direction, and one of great significance in Korean estimation, was made, the date of the Gazette being given thus. Number 1. 504th year of the dynasty, 4th moon, 1st day, Wood Day. Footnote. Wood Day is the term adopted by the Japanese for Thursday, their week, which has now been imposed on the Koreans, being Sunday, Moon Day, Fire Day, Water Day, Wood Day, Metal Day, and Earth Day. End footnote. Two months later, further changes in the official gazette were announced, and the program then put forward has been adhered to, paving the way for many of the changes which have followed. It is difficult to make the importance of the gazette intelligible, except to foreigners who have resided in China and Korea. The reason for dwelling so long upon it is that for several centuries the publication in it of royal edicts has given them the force of law, and the currency of Acts of Parliament. In the pages which follow, a brief summary is given of the outlines of the scheme for the reorganization of the Korean government, which was prepared for the most part by the Japanese advisers, honorary and salaried, who have been engaged on the task since 1894, and which has been accepted by the king. The first change raised the status of the king and the royal family to that of the imperial family of China. After this, it was enacted, following on the king's oath of January 1895, that the queen and royal family were no longer to interfere in the affairs of state, and that his majesty would govern by the advice of a cabinet, and sign all ordinances to which his assent is given. The cabinet, which was, at least nominally, located in the palace, had two aspects, a council of state and a state department, presided over by the premier. 1. As the council of state. The members of the cabinet or ministers of state were the premier, the home minister, the minister for foreign affairs, the finance minister, the war minister, the minister of education, the minister of justice, and the Minister of Agriculture, Trade and Industry. A foreign advisor is supposed to be attached to each of the seven departments. Ministers in Council were empowered to consider, 
the framing of laws and ordinances, estimates and balance sheets of yearly revenue and expenditure, public debt, domestic and foreign, international treaties and important conventions, disputes as to the respective jurisdictions of ministers, such personal memorials as His Majesty might send down to them, supplies not included in the estimates, appointments and promotions of high officials, other than legal or military, the retention, abolition or alteration of old customs, abolition or institution of offices, and, without reference to their special relations to any one ministry, their reconstruction or amendment, the imposition of new taxes or their alteration, and the control and management of public lands, forests, buildings and vessels. All ordinances after being signed and sealed by the king required the countersign of the premier. The second function of the cabinet as a department of state it is needless to go into. A privy council was established at the close of 1894 to take the place of the deliberative assembly which had collapsed and is now empowered, when consulted by the cabinet, to inquire into and pass resolutions concerning 1. the framing of laws and ordinances, 2. questions which may from time to time be referred to it by the cabinet. The council consists of a president, vice-president, not more than fifty councillors, two secretaries, and four clerks. The councillors are appointed by the Crown on the recommendation of the Premier, and must either be men of rank, or those who have done good service to the State, or are experts in politics, law, or economics. The Privy Council is prohibited from having any correspondence on public matters with private individuals or with any officials but ministers and vice-ministers. The President presides. Two-thirds of the members must be present to form a quorum. Votes are given openly, resolutions are carried by a majority, and any councillor dissenting from a resolution so carried has a right to have his reasons recorded in the minutes. In the autumn of 1896, some important changes were made. A decree of the 24th of September condemned in strong language the action of disorderly rebels who some three years ago revolutionized the constitution and changed the name of the king's advising body. The decree ordained that the old name, translated Council of State, should be restored and declared that new regulations would be issued which, while adhering to ancient principles, would confirm such of the enactments of the previous three years as in the King's judgment were for the public good. The Council of State was organized by the first ordinance of a new series, and the preamble, as well as one at least of the sections, marks a distinctly retrograde movement and a reversion to the absolutism renounced in the King's oath of January 1895. It is distinctly stated that any motion debated at the Council may receive His Majesty's assent without regard to the number of votes in its favour, by virtue of the royal prerogative. Or, should the debates on any motion not accord with His Majesty's views, the Council may be commanded to reconsider the matter. Resolutions which the King approves, on publication in the Gazette, become law. Thus perished the checks which the Japanese sought to impose on the absolutism of the crown, and at the present time the royal will, or whim, can and does override all else. This Oyi Chieng Pu, or council, like the Nai Kak, its predecessor, is both a council of state and a state department presided over by the chancellor. The members of the council of state are the chancellor, the Home Minister, who is ex officio Vice-Chancellor, the Ministers of Foreign Affairs, Finance, War, Justice and Agriculture, five councillors, and the Chief Secretary. As a State Department under the Chancellor, the staff consists of the Director of the General Bureau, the Chancellor's Private Secretary, the Secretary, and eight clerks. The Council of State, as now constituted, 
is empowered to pass resolutions concerning the enactment, abrogation, alteration, or interpretation of laws or regulations, peace and war and the making of treaties, restoration of domestic order, telegraphs, railways, mines, and other undertakings, and questions of compensation arising therefrom, the estimates and special appropriations, taxes, duties, and excise, matters sent down to the Council by special command of the Sovereign, publication of laws and regulations approved by the King. The King, if he so pleases, is present in person, or may send the heir apparent to represent him. The Chancellor presides, two-thirds of the members form a quorum, motions are carried by a numerical majority, and finally a memorial stating in outline the debate and its issue is submitted by the Chancellor to the King, who issues such commands as may seem to him best, for, as previously stated, His Majesty is not bound to acquiesce in the decision of the majority. The Oyi Chieng Pu, as a Department of State through the Director of the General Bureau, has three sections, Archives, Gazette and Accounts, and is rather a recording than an initiating office. The scheme for the reconstruction of the provincial and metropolitan governments has introduced many important changes and retrenchments. The 13 provinces are now divided into 339 prefectures, Seoul having a government of its own. The vast entourage of provincial authorities has been reduced, and the provincial governor's staff is now limited, nominally at least, to six clerks, two chief constables, thirty police, ten writers, four ushers, fifteen messengers, eight coolies, and eight boys. Ordinances under the head of local government define the jurisdiction, powers, duties, period of office, salaries, and etiquette of all officials, along with many minor matters. Footnote. Official intercourse. Ordinance 45 amends some old practices regulating the intercourse and correspondence of officials. The etiquette of the official call by a newly appointed prefect on the governor, on the whole, is retained, although it is in some respects simplified. The old fashion obliged the magistrate to remain outside the Yamen gate, while a large folded sheet of white paper inscribed with his name was sent in to the governor. The latter thereupon gave orders to his personal attendants or ushers to admit the magistrate. The to-in, as they were commonly styled, called out, Sar Yang, to which the servants chanted a reply. The governor being seated, the magistrate knelt outside the room and bowed to the ground. To this obeisance, the governor replied by raising his arms over his head. The magistrate was asked his name and age given some stereotyped advice, and dismissed. The governor is for the future to return the bow of the prefect, and conversation is to be conducted in terms of mutual respect, the magistrate describing himself as Ha Kuan, your subordinate, and addressing the governor by his title. End footnote. It is in this department that the reforms instituted by the Japanese are the most sweeping. Very many offices were abolished, and all government property belonging to the establishments of the officials holding them was ordered to be handed over to officers of the new regime. A local government bureau was established with sections, under which local finance in cities and towns and local expenditure of every kind were to be dealt with. An engineering bureau dealing with civil engineering and a land survey a registration bureau dealing with an annual census of the population and the registration of lands, a sanitary bureau and an accounts bureau form part of the very ambitious local government scheme, admirable on paper, and which, if it were honestly carried out, would strike at the roots of many of the abuses which are the curse of Korea. The whole provincial system, as reorganized, is under the Home Office. 
An important part of the new scheme is the definition of the duties and jurisdiction of the ministers of state. The cabinet orders dealing with the duties and discipline of officials at large so far issued are Order 1. General rules for the conduct of public business. Order 2. Memorabilia for officials. Order 3. Resumption of office after mourning. Order 4. Reprimand and correction. Order 5. Obligation to purchase the Gazette. Order 6. Memorials to be on ruled paper. The management of public offices under the new system is practically the same as the Japanese. The memorabilia for officials are as follows. A. No official must trespass outside his own jurisdiction. B. Where duties have been deputed to a subordinate, the latter must not be continually interfered with. C. A subordinate ordered to do anything which in his opinion is irregular or irrelevant should expostulate with his senior. If the latter holds by his opinion, the junior must conform. D. Officials must be straightforward and outspoken, and not give outward acquiescence while privately criticizing or hindering their superiors. E. Officials must not listen to suggestions from outsiders or talk with them on official business. F. Officials must be frank with one another and not form cliques. G. No official must willfully spread false rumors about another or lightly credit such. H. No official must absent himself from office without permission during office hours or frequent the houses of others. Resolution 88, passed some months earlier, was even more explicit. Officials are thereby forbidden to divulge official secrets even when witnesses in a court of law, unless specially permitted to do so, or to show dispatches to outsiders. They are not allowed to become directors or managers in a public company, to accept compensation from private individuals or gifts from their subordinates, to undertake, without permission, extra work for payment, or to put to private use government horses. They may receive honours or presents from foreign sovereigns or governments only with the special sanction of His Majesty. An ordinance restored the use of the uniforms worn prior to the Reformation, whether court dress, full dress, half dress, or undress, and announced that neither officials nor private persons were to be compelled any longer to wear black. Each department is presided over by a minister, who is empowered to issue departmental orders as instructions to the local officials and police, and notifications to the people. His jurisdiction over the police and local officials is concurrent with that of his colleagues, who must also be consulted by him before recommending to the throne the promotion or degradation of the higher officials of his departmental staff. Under the minister is a vice-minister, empowered to act for him on occasion, and, when doing so, possessing equal privileges. The vice-minister is usually the head of the minister's secretariat, which deals with confidential matters, promotions, custody of the ministers and departmental seals, receipt and dispatch of correspondence, and consultation of precedents, preparation of statistics, compilation and preservation of archives. In addition to the secretariats, there are a number of bureau, both secretariats and bureau being, for convenience, subdivided into sections, each of which has its special duties. The departments of government are as follows. Home Office The Home Minister has charge of matters concerning local government, police, jails, civil engineering, sanitation, shrines and temples, surveying, printing census, and public charity, as well as the general supervision of the local authorities and the police. Foreign Office the foreign minister is vested with the control of international affairs, the protection of Korean commercial interests abroad, 
and the supervision of the diplomatic and consular services. The Treasury The Minister for Finance, being vested with the control of the finances of the government, will have charge of all matters relating to accounts, revenue and expenditure, taxes, national debts, the currency, banks and the like, and will have supervision under the finances of each local administration. Ordinance 54, Paragraph 1. Under this minister there is a taxation bureau with three sections, land tax, excise and customs. Footnote. The finances of Korea are now practically under British management. Mr. J. M. Levy Brown, LLD, of the Chinese Imperial Maritime Customs and Chief Commissioner of Customs for Korea, having undertaken in addition the post of financial adviser to the Treasury, and a royal edict having been issued that every order for a payment out of the national purse, down to the smallest, should be countersigned by him. End footnote. The ordinances connected with the remodeled system of taxation and the salaries and expenses of officials are very numerous and minute. The appropriation actually in money for the sovereign's privy purse was fixed at $500,000. War Office The Minister for War, who must be a general officer, has charge of the military administration of an army lately fixed at 6,000 men, and the chief control of men and matters in the army, and is to exercise supervision over army divisions and all buildings and forts under his department. The new military arrangements are very elaborate. Ministry of Education In this important department, besides the minister and vice-minister and heads of bureau and sections, there are three special secretaries who act as inspectors of schools, and an official specially deputed to compile and select textbooks. Besides the minister's secretariat, there are the Education Bureau, which is concerned with primary, normal, intermediary, foreign language, technical and industrial schools, and students abroad, and a Compilation Bureau, concerned with the selection, translation and compilation of textbooks, the purchase, preservation and arrangement of volumes, and the printing of books. Under this department has been placed the Confucian College, an institution of the old regime, the purpose of which was to attend to the Temple of Literature, in which, as in China, the memorial tablets of Confucius, Mencius and the Sages are honoured, and to encourage the study of the classical books. The subjects for study are the Three Classics, Four Books and Popular Commentary, Chinese Composition, Outlines of Chinese History, of the Song, Yuan and Ming Dynasties. To meet the reformed requirements, this college has been reorganized, and the students, who must be between the ages of 20 and 40, of good character, persevering, intelligent and well acquainted with affairs, are in addition put through a course of Korean and foreign annals, Korean and foreign geography, and arithmetic. Ministry of Justice The Minister of Justice has charge of judicial matters, pardons and restorations to rank, instructions for public prosecution, and supervision over special courts, high courts and district courts, and the department forms a high court of justice for the hearing of certain appeals. Ministry of Agriculture, Trade and Industry The Minister of Agriculture has charge of all matters relating to agriculture, commerce, industries, posts, telegraphs, shipping and marine officers. In this department, besides the Minister's Secretariat, there are Bureau of Agriculture, Communications, Trade, Industry, Mining and Accounts. The Bureau of Agriculture contains Agricultural, Forest and Natural Products sections, that of Communications, Post, Telegraph and Marine sections, and that of Trade and Industry deals with Commerce, Trading Corporations, Weights and Measures, Manufacturers, 
and factories. The Mining Bureau has sections for mines and geology, and the Bureau of Accounts deals with the inventories and expenditure of the department. The Village System Besides the reorganization of these important departments of state, a design for a village system, organized as follows, is to supersede that which had decayed with the general decay of government in Korea. The country is now divided into districts, kun, each kun containing a number of mien or cantons, each of which includes a number of ni or villages. The old posts and titles are abolished, and each village is now to be provided with the following officers. 1. Headman. He must be over 30 years of age and is elected for one year by the householders. The office is honorary. 2. Clerk. He holds office under the same conditions as the headman, under whom he keeps the books and issues notices. 3. Elder. Nominated by the householders, he acts for the headman as occasion demands. 4. Bailiff. Elected at the same time as the headman, he performs the usual duties of a servant or messenger and holds office for a year on good behavior. The corresponding officers of the canton, commune, are a mayor, a clerk, a bailiff, and a communal usher, who is irremovable except for cause given, and is, like the other officials, elected by the canton. A village council is composed of the headmen and one man from each family, and is empowered to pass resolutions on matters connected with education, registration of households or lands, sanitation, roads and bridges, communal grain exchanges, agricultural improvements, common woods and dikes, payment of taxes, relief in famine or other calamity, adjustment of the corvée, savings associations, and bylaws. The headman, who acts as chairman, has not only a casting vote, but the power to veto. A resolution passed over the veto of the headman has to be referred to the mayor, and over the veto of the mayor to the prefect. If passed twice over the veto of the prefect, reference may be made to the governor. All resolutions, however, must be submitted twice a year to the Home Office, through the prefect and governor, and it is incumbent on the prefectural council to sit at least twice in the year. Taxes are by law of 13th October 1895, classified as land tax, scutage, mining dues, customs dues, and excise. Excise is now made to include, besides ginseng dues, what are known as miscellaneous dues, that is, rent of glebe lands, tax on rushes used in mat-making, market dues on firewood and tobacco, tax on kilns, tax on edible seaweed, tax on grindstones, upriver dues, and taxes on fisheries, salterns, and boats. All other imposts have been declared illegal. The first Korean budget under the reformed system was published in January 1896 and showed an estimated revenue from all sources of $4,809,410. The palace department underwent reorganization, nominally at least, and elaborate schemes for the administration of royal establishments, state temples and mausolea were devised, and the relative rank of members of the royal clan, including ladies, was fixed, the ladies of the king's seraglio being divided into eight classes, and those of the crown prince into four. The number of court officials attached to the different royal households, though diminished, is legion. Various ordinances brought the classification of Korean officials into line with those of Japan. Every class in the country, private and official, has come into the purview of the reorganizers and finds its position, on paper, more or less altered. Among the more important of the edicts which have nominally become law are the following. Agreements with China cancelled. 
distinctions between patrician and plebeian abolished, slavery abolished, early marriages prohibited, remarriage of widows permitted, bribery to be strictly forbidden, no one to be arrested without warrant for civil offences. Couriers, mountebanks and butchers no longer to be under degradation. Local councils to be established. New coinage issued. Organization of police force. No one to be punished without trial. Irregular taxation by provincial governments forbidden. Extortion of money by officials forbidden. Family of a criminal not to be involved in his doom. Great modifications as to torture. Superfluous paraphernalia abolished. School of instruction in vaccination. Hair cropping proclamation. Solar calendar adopted. Drilled troops, kunrentai, abolished. Legal punishments defined. Slaughterhouses licensed. Committee of legal revision appointed. Telegraph regulations. Postal regulations. Railways placed under Bureau of Communications. These ordinances are a selection from among several hundred promulgated since July 1895. Of the reforms notified during the last three and a half years, several have not taken effect, and concerning others there has been a distinctly retrograde movement, with a tendency to revert to the abuses of the old regime, and others which were taken in hand earnestly have gradually collapsed, owing in part to the limpness of the Korean character, and in part to the opposition of all in office, and of all who hope for office, to any measures of reform. Some, admirable in themselves, at present exist only on paper, but, on the whole, the reorganized system, though in many respects fragmentary, is a great improvement on the old one, and it may not unreasonably be hoped that the young men, who are now being educated in enlightened ideas and notions of honor, will not repeat the iniquities of their fathers. End of section 34、section、thirty five of Korea and her neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in June two thousand twenty one. Chapter thirty three Education and Foreign Trade. Korean education has hitherto failed to produce patriots, thinkers, or honest men. It has been conducted thus. In an ordinary Korean school, the pupils, seated on the floor with their Chinese books in front of them, the upper parts of their bodies swaying violently from side to side or backwards and forwards, from daylight till sunset, vociferate at the highest and loudest pitch of their voices their assigned lessons from the Chinese classics, committing them to memory or reciting them aloud, writing the Chinese characters, filling their receptive memories with fragments of the learning of the Chinese sages and passages of mythical history. The begoggled teacher, erudite and supercilious, rod in hand and with a book before him, now and then throwing in a word of correction in stentorian tones which rise above the din. This educational mill grinding for ten or more years enabled the average youth to aspire to the literary degrees which were conferred at the Kwanga or royal examinations held in Seoul up to 1894, and which were regarded as the stepping stones to official position, the great object of Korean ambition. There is nothing in this education to develop the thinking powers or to enable the student to understand the world he lives in. The effort to acquire a difficult language, the knowledge of which gives him a mastery of his own, is in itself a desirable mental discipline, and the ethical teachings of Confucius and Mencius, however defective, contain much that is valuable and true, but beyond this, little that is favorable can be said. Narrowness, grooviness, conceit, superciliousness, a false pride which despises manual labor, 
a selfish individualism, destructive of generous public spirit and social trustfulness, a slavery in act and thought to customs and traditions two thousand years old, a narrow intellectual view, a shallow moral sense, and an estimate of women essentially degrading, appear to be the products of the Korean educational system. With the abolition of the royal examinations, a change as to the methods of government appointments, the working of the Western Leaven, the increased prominence given to Enmun, and the slow entrance of new ideas into the country, some of the desire for this purely Chinese education has passed away, and it has been found necessary to stimulate what threatened to become a flagged interest in all education by new educational methods and forces, the influence of which should radiate from the capital. There are now, October 1897, government vernacular schools, a government school for the study of English, foreign language schools, and mission schools. Outside the vernacular and mission schools, there is the before-mentioned Royal English School, with 100 students in uniform, regularly drilled by a British sergeant of marines, and crazy about football. These young men, in appearance, manners, and rapid advance in knowledge of English, reflect great credit on their instructors. After this come Japanese, French, and Russian schools, at present chiefly linguistic. Mr. Birukov, in charge of the Russian school, was a captain of light artillery in the Russian army, and in both the Russian and French schools the students are drilled daily by Russian drill instructors. Undoubtedly, the establishment which has exercised and is exercising the most powerful educational, moral, and intellectual influence in Korea is the Pai Chai College, Hall for the Rearing of Useful Men, so named by the king in 1887. This, which belongs to the American Methodist Episcopal Church, has had the advantage of the services of one principal, the Rev. H. G. Appenzeller, for eleven years. It has a Chinese Enmun department, for the teaching of the Chinese classics, Sheffield's Universal History, etc., a small theological department and an English department, in which reading, grammar, composition, spelling, history, geography, arithmetic, and the elements of chemistry and natural philosophy are taught. Dr. Jai Son, a Korean educated in America, has recently lectured once a week at this college on the geographical divisions of the earth and the political and ecclesiastical history of Europe, and has awakened much enthusiasm. A patriotic spirit is being developed among the students, as well as something of the English public school spirit with its traditions of honor. This college is undoubtedly making a decided impression, and is giving, besides a liberal education, a measure of that broader intellectual view and deepened moral sense which may yet prove the salvation of Korea. Christian instruction is given in Korean, and attendance at chapel is compulsory. The pupils are drilled, and early in 1897, during the military craze, adopted a neat European military uniform. There is a flourishing industrial department, which includes a trilingual press and a bookbinding establishment, both of which have full employment. Early in 1895, the government, recognizing the importance of the secular education given in this college, made an agreement by which it could place pupils up to the number of 200 there, paying for their tuition and the salaries of certain tutors. There are other schools for girls and boys in which an industrial training is given, conducted with some success by the same mission, and the American Presbyterians have several useful schools and pay much attention to the training of girls. The Société des Missions Étrangères has in Seoul an orphanage and two boys' schools, with a total of 262 children. The principal object is to train the orphans as good Roman Catholics. In the boys' schools, the pupils are taught to read and write Chinese and Enmun, and to a limited extent, they study the Chinese classics. The religious instruction is given in Enmun. 
they aim at providing a primary education for the children of Korean converts. The boys in the orphanage are taught Enmun only, and at 13 are adopted by Roman Catholics in Seoul or the country, and learn either farming or trades, or, assuming their own support, enter a trade or become servants. The elder girls learn Enmun, sewing and housework, and at 15 are married to the sons of Roman Catholics. At Ryongsan, near Seoul, there is a theological seminary for the training of candidates for the priesthood. Besides these, there is a school established in 1896 by the Japanese Foreign Educational Society, which is composed chiefly of advanced Japanese Christians. The course of study embraces the Chinese classics, Enmun, composition, the study of Japanese as a medium for the study of Western learning, and lectures on science and religion. This school was intended by its founders to work as a Christian propaganda. In 1897, there were in Seoul nearly 900 students, chiefly young men, in mission and foreign schools, inclusive of 100 in the Royal English School, which has English teachers. In the majority of these, the students are trained in Christian morality, fundamental science, general history, and the principles of patriotism. A certain amount of denationalization is connected with most of the boys' schools, for the students necessarily receive new ideas, thoughts, and views of life, which cannot be shaken out of them by any local circumstances, changing their standpoints and the texture of their minds for life. When they replace the elder generation, better things may be expected for Korea. The Korean reformed ideas of education, which had their origin during the Japanese reform era, embraced the creation of a primary school system, an efficient normal college, and intermediate schools. Actually existing under the Department of Education are a revived Confucian school, the Royal English School, and the Normal College, placed in May 1897 under the very efficient care of the Rev. H. B. Halbert, M.A., a capable and scholarly man, some of whose contributions to our knowledge of Korean poetry and music have enriched earlier chapters of these volumes. Textbooks in Enmun and teachers who can teach them have to be created. It is hoped and expected that supply will follow demand, and that in a few years the larger provincial towns will possess intermediate or high schools, and the villages attain the advantages of elementary schools, all using a uniform series of textbooks in the vernacular. Chinese finds its place in the curriculum, but not as the medium for teaching Korean and general history, or geography and arithmetic, which must be acquired through the native tongue. In spite of the somewhat spasmodic and altogether unscientific methods of the education department, it has succeeded in getting the revived normal college underway, as well as a fair number of primary schools, where over 1,000 boys are learning the elements of arithmetic, geography, and Korean history, with brief outlines of the systems of government in other civilized countries. Seventy-seven youths are studying in Japan at government expense and have made fair progress in languages, but are said to show a lack of mathematical aptitude and logical power. Altogether, the Korean educational outlook is not without elements of hopefulness. Though the foreign trade of Korea only averaged something less than £1,500,000 annually, the potential commerce of a country with not less than 12 million of people, all cotton-clad, ought not to be overlooked. The amount of foreign trade which exists is the growth of 13 years only, but when we remember that Korea is a purely agricultural country of a very primitive and backward type, that many of her finest valleys are practically isolated by mountain ranges, traversed by nearly impassable roads, that the tyranny of custom is strong, that the Korean farmer is only just learning that a profitable and almost unlimited demand exists for his rice and beans across the sea, 
that the serious cost of his cotton clothing can be kept down by importing foreign yarn or piece goods, and that his comfort can be increased by the introduction of articles of foreign manufacture, and that such facts are only slowly entering the secluded valleys of the hermit kingdom, the actual bulk of the trade is rather surprising, and its possibilities are worth considering. The net imports of foreign goods have increased from the value of $2,474,189 in 1886 to $6,531,324 in 1896. Measured in dollars, the trade of 1896 exceeds that of any previous year except 1895, when the occupation of Korea by Japanese troops, with their large following of transport coolies, created an artificial expansion. Among Korean exports, which chiefly consist of beans, fish, dried manure, cow hides, ginseng, paper, rice, and seaweed, there are none which are likely to find a market elsewhere than in China and Japan, but Korea, so far as rice goes, is on the way to become the granary of the latter country, her export in 1890 having reached a value of £271,000. With imports, Korean countries, India and America are concerned. Without, I think, being over-sanguine, I anticipate a time when, with improved roads, railroads and enlightenment, together with security for the earnings of labor from official and patrician exactions, the Korea will have no further occasion for protecting himself by an appearance of squalid poverty, and when he will become on a largely increased scale a consumer as well as a producer, and will surround himself with comforts and luxuries of foreign manufacture, as his brethren are already doing under the happier rule of Russia. Under the improved conditions which it is reasonable to expect, I should not be surprised if the value of the foreign trade of Korea were to reach ten million pounds in another quarter of a century, and the share which England is to have of it is an important question. Our great competitor in the Korean markets is Japan, and we have to deal not only with a rival within twenty hours of Korean shores, and with nearly a monopoly of the carrying trade, but with the most nimble-witted, adaptive, persevering, and pushing people of our day. It is inevitable that British hardware and miscellaneous articles must be ousted by the products of Japanese cheaper labor, and that the Japanese will continue to supply the increasing demand for scissors, knives, matches, needles, hoes, grass knives, soap, perfumes, kerosene lamps, iron cooking pots, nails, and the like, but the loss of the trade in cotton piece goods would be a serious matter, and the possibility of it has to be faced. The value of the import trade in 1896 was 708,461 pounds, as against, as against 875,816 pounds for 1895, an exceptional year, and the larger part of this reduction took place in articles of British manufacture, the decrease of 134,304 pounds in the value of cotton imports falling almost entirely on cottons of British origin, the Japanese import not only retaining its position, in spite of adverse circumstances, but showing a slight increase. Japanese sheetings showed a substantial increase, more than counterbalanced by the diminished import of the British and American article, and Japanese cotton yarn continued to arrive in larger quantities and is gradually driving British and Indian yarn out of the Korean market. It can be sold at a considerable lower price than the British article, and practically at the same price as the Indian, with which its improved quality enables it to compete on very favorable terms. As the result of inquiries carried on during my two journeys in the interior, as well as at the treaty ports, it does not appear to me that Japanese success is even chiefly caused by proximity, and in 1896 she had to compete with the enterprise and energy of the Chinese, 
who, having returned after the war to the benefits of British protection, were pushing the distribution of Manchester goods imported from Shanghai. Rather, I am inclined to think that the success of our rival is mainly due to causes which I have seen in operation in Persia and Central Asia, as well as in Korea, and which embrace not only imperfect knowledge of the tastes and needs of customers, but the neglect to act upon information supplied by consular and diplomatic agents, a groovy adherence to British methods of manufacture, and the ignoring of native desires as to colors, patterns, and the widths and makes which suit native clothing and treatment, and the size of bales best suited to native methods of transport. I do not allude to the charge oft times made against our manufacturers of supplying inferior cottons, because I have never seen any indications of its correctness, nor have I heard any complaints on the subject either in Korea or China, but of the ignoring of the requirements of customers there is no doubt. It is everywhere a grievance and source of loss, and is likely to lose us the prospective advantages of the Korean market. The Japanese success, putting the advantages of proximity aside, is, I believe, mainly due to the accuracy of the information obtained by their keen-witted agents, who have visited all the towns and villages in Korea, and to the carefulness with which their manufacturers are studying the tastes and requirements of the Korean market. Their goods reach the shore in manageable bales, which do not require to be adapted after arrival to the minute Korean pony, and their price, width, length, and texture commend them to the Korean customer. The Japanese understand that cotton 18 inches wide is the only cotton from which Korean garments can be fashioned without very considerable waste, and they supply the market with it and on the report of the agents of the importing firms, the weavers of Osaka and other manufacturing towns, with adroitness and rapidity, closely adapted the texture, width, and length of their cottons to those of the handloom cotton goods made in South Korea, which are deservedly popular for their durability, and have succeeded not only in producing an imitation of Korean cotton cloth, which stands the pounding and beating of Korean washing, but one which actually deceives the Korean weavers themselves as to its origin, and which has won great popularity with the Korean women. If Korea is to be a British market in the future, the lost ground must be recovered by working on Japanese lines, which are the lines of commercial common sense. To sum up, I venture to express the opinion that the circumstances of the large population of Korea are destined to gradual improvement with the aid of either Japan or Russia, that foreign trade must increase more or less steadily with increased buying powers and improved means of transport, and that the amount which falls to the share of Great Britain will depend largely upon whether British manufacturers are willing or not to adapt their goods to Korean tastes and convenience. As instances of the aptitude of the Koreans for taking to foreign articles which suit their needs, it may be mentioned, on the authority of a report from the British Consul General to the British Foreign Office on Trade and Finance in Korea for 1896, presented to Parliament July 1897, that the import of lucifer matches reached the figure of 11,386 pounds, while that of American and Russian kerosene exceeded 36,000 pounds. In 1896, the export of gold increased and was $1,390,412, one million dollars worth being exported from Wonsan alone. The gold export included the excess of Korean imports over exports was only about £50,000, and as it is estimated that only one half of the gold actually leaving the country is declared, it may be assumed that Korea is able to pay for a larger supply of foreign goods than she has hitherto taken. The statistics of Korean foreign trade which are to be found in the appendix are the latest returns, supplied to me by the courtesy of the Korean Customs Department, the returns of shipping and of principal articles of export and import 
being taken from Her British Majesty's Consul General's Report for 1896, presented to Parliament July 1897. With reference to the shipping returns, it must be observed that the British flag is practically unrepresented in Korean waters, even a chartered British steamer being rarely seen. The monopoly of the carrying trade, which Japan has enjoyed, has only lately been broken into by the establishment of a Russian subsidized line as a competitor. In addition to the trade of the three ports open to foreign trade in 1896, to which the returns given refer exclusively, there is that carried on by the non-treaty ports and on the Chinese and Russian frontiers. In concluding this brief notice of the foreign trade of Korea, I may remark that Japanese competition, so far as it consists in the ability to undersell us owing to cheaper labor, is likely to diminish year by year, as the conditions under which goods can be manufactured gradually approximate to those which exist in England. The rapidly increasing price of the necessaries of life in Japan, the demand for more than a living wage, and an appreciation of the advantages of combination, all tending in this direction. On the subject of finance, there is little to be said. The principal items of revenue are a land tax of $6 on a fertile kill and $5 on a mountain kill, a house tax of 60 cents annually, from which houses in the capital are exempt, the ginseng tax and the gold dues, making up a budget of about $4 million, a sum amply sufficient for the legitimate expenditure of the country. The land tax is extremely light. Only about a third of the revenue actually collected reaches the national treasury, partly owing to the infinite corruption of the officials through whose hands it passes, and partly because provincial income and expenditure are to a certain extent left to local management. If the government is in earnest in the all-important matter of educating the people, the increased expenditure can readily be met by imposing taxation on such articles of luxury as wine and tobacco, which are enormously consumed, Seoul alone possessing 475 wine shops and 1,100 tobacco shops. But even without resorting to any new source of revenue, with strict supervision and regular accounts, the income of the central government is capable of considerable expansion. In spite of the awful official corruption which has been revealed, and the chaos which up to 1896 prevailed in the treasury, the Korean financial outlook is a hopeful one. At the close of 1895, the king persuaded Mr. Mlevi Brown, LLD, the chief commissioner of customs, to undertake the thankless office of adviser to the treasury, confirming his position some months later by the issue of an edict, making his signature essential to all orders for payments out of the national purse. Korean imagination and ingenuity are chiefly fertile in devising tricks and devices for getting hold of public money, and anything more hydra-headed than the dishonesty of Korean official life cannot be found, so that it is not surprising that as soon as the foreign adviser blocks one nefarious proceeding, another is sprung upon him, and that the army of useless drones, deprived of their vested interests by the judicious retrenchments which have been made, as well as thousands who are trembling for their ill-gotten gains, should oppose financial reform by every device of oriental ingenuity. However, race, as represented by the honor and capacity of one European, is carrying the day, and Korean finance is gradually being placed on a sound basis. With careful management, judicious retrenchments of expenditure, the reduction of the chaos in the treasury to an orderly system of accounts, and a different methods of collecting the land tax, which is now being remitted with tolerable regularity to the treasury, an actual financial equilibrium was established and maintained during the year 1896, which closed with a considerable surplus, and in April 1897, one million dollars of the Japanese loan of three millions was repaid to Japan, 
and there is every prospect that the remaining indebtedness might be paid off out of income in 1899, leaving Korea in the proud position of a country without a national debt, and with a surplus of income over expenditure. The prosperous financial conclusion of 1896 is all the more remarkable because of certain exceptional expenditures. Two new regiments were added to the army. The old arsenal, a disused costly toy, was put into working order, with all necessary modern improvements, under the supervision of a Russian machinist. The King Wun Palace was built, costly ceremonies and works connected with the late Queen's prospective funeral were paid for, and a considerable area of Western Seoul was recreated. All civil government employees, and they are legion, as well as soldiers and police, are paid regularly every month, and sinecures are very slowly disappearing. A Korean silver, copper, and brass coinage, convenient as well as ornamental, is coming into general circulation, and as it gradually displaces cash, is setting trade free from at least one of the conditions which hampered it, and increased banking facilities are tending in the same direction. End of section 35section thirty six of korea and her neighbors by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in june two thousand twenty one chapter thirty four demonism or shamanism korean cities without priests or temples houses without god shelves village festivals without a mikoshi or idols carried in festive procession, marriage and burial without priestly blessing, an absence of religious ceremonials and sacred books to which real or assumed reverence is paid, and nothing to show that religion has any hold on the popular mind, constitute a singular Korean characteristic. Putting aside Buddhism with its gross superstitions, practiced chiefly in remote places, and the magisterial homage before the Confucian tablets to the memory of the great teacher, the popular cult, I dare not call it a religion, consists of a number of observances dictated by the dread of bodiless beings created by Korean fancy, and representing chiefly the mysterious forces of nature. It may be assumed, taking tradition for a guide, as certain of the litanies used in exorcism and invocation were introduced along with Buddhism from China, that Korean imagination has grafted its own fancies on those which are of foreign origin, and which are of by no means distant kinship to those of the shamanism of northern Asia. The external evidences of this cult are chiefly heaps of stones on the tops of passes, rude shrines here and there containing tawdry pictures of mythical beings with the name in chinese characters below strings from which depend small bags of rice worn-out straw shoes strips of dirty rags and though rarely rusty locks of black hair outside of many villages are high posts not to be confounded with the distance posts with their tops rudely carved into heads and faces half human, half demonic, from which straw ropes, which dependent straw tassels, recalling the Shintoism of Japan, are stretched across the road. There are large or distorted trees also, on which rags, rice bags and old shoes are hung, and under which are heaps of stones, at which it is usual for travellers to bow and expectorate. On the ridge poles of royal buildings and city gates there are rows of grotesque bronze or china figures for the purpose of driving away evil demons, and at crossroads a log of wood perforated like a mouse trap, and with one hole bunged up, over which travellers step carefully, may sometimes be seen. In cities the beatings of drums accompanied by the clashing of cymbals vies with the laundry sticks in breaking the otherwise profound stillness of night, and in travelling through the country, the mutang or sorceress is constantly to be seen, 
going through various musical and dancing performances in the midst of a crowd in front of a house where there is sickness. I have referred to these things in earlier chapters, but the subject is such an important one, and the influence on Korean life of the belief in demons is so strong and injurious, that I feel justified in laying before my readers at some length such details of demonism as have hitherto been ascertained. There is an unwillingness to speak to foreigners on this topic, and inquirers may have been purposely misled, but enough has been gained to make it likely that further inquiry will be productive of very valuable results. Footnote. I desire again to express my indebtedness to the Rev. G. Hebert Jones of Chemul Po for the loan of, and the liberty to use, his very careful and painstaking notes on the subject of Korean demonism, and also to a paper on The Exorcism of Spirits in Korea by Dr. Landis of Chemul Po. Apart from the researches of those two Korean scholars, the result of my own inquiry and observation would scarcely have been worth publishing. End footnote. The superstitions already mentioned, however trivial in themselves, point to that which underlies all religion, the belief in something outside ourselves which is higher or more powerful than ourselves. It is indeed asserted by many of the so-called educated class that the only cult in Korea is ancestor worship, and they profess to ridicule the rags, cairns, shrines, and the other paraphernalia of demon worship as the superstition of women and coolies, and it is probable that, in Seoul at least, few men of the upper class are believers, or patronize the rites otherwise than as unmeaning customs which it would be impolitic to discontinue. But it is safe to say that from the palace to the hovel, all women, and the majority of men, go through the forms which, influencing Buddhism and possibly being modified by it, have existed in Korea for more than fifteen centuries. Without claiming any degree of scientific accuracy for the term shamanism, as applied to this cult in Korea, it is more convenient to use it, the word demon having come to bear a popular meaning which prohibits its use where good spirits as well as bad are indicated. So far as I know, shamanism exists only in Asia, and flourishes specially among the tribes north of the Amur, the Samoyeds, Ostiaks, etc., as well as among hill tribes on the southwestern frontier of China. The term shaman may be applied to all persons, male or female, whose profession it is to have direct dealings with demons, and to possess the power of securing their goodwill and averting their malignant influences by various magical rites, charms and incantations, to cure diseases by exorcisms, to predict future events, and to interpret dreams. Korean shamanism or demonism differs from that of Northern Asia in its mildness, possibly the result of early Buddhist influence. It is the cult of demons not necessarily evil, but usually the enemies of man, and addicted to revenge and caprice. Though the shamans are neither an order, nor are linked by a common organization, they are practically recognized as a priesthood, in so far as it is through their offices that the demons are approached and propitiated on behalf of the people. It is supposed that the shaman or wizard was one of the figures in the dawn of Korean history, and that demonism in its early stage was marked by human sacrifices. Shamans in the train of royalty, and as a part of the social organization of the peninsula, figure in very early Korean story, and they appear to have been the chief, if not the only, religious instructors. One class among the shamans is incorporated into one of those guilds which are the trades unions of Korea, and the government has imposed registration on another class. Footnote. What is true in Korea today may be untrue tomorrow. One month there was a police raid in Seoul upon the mutang or sorceresses, another the sisterhood was flourishing, and so the pendulum swings. End footnote. 
There are now two principal classes of shamans, the Pansu and the Mutang. The Pansu are blind sorcerers, and those parents are fortunate who have a blind son, for he is certain to be able to make a good living and support them in their old age. The Pansu were formerly persons of much distinction in the kingdom, but their social position has been lowered during the present dynasty, though in the present reign their influence in the palace, and specially with the late queen, has wrought much evil. The chief officials of the Pansu guild in Seoul hold the official titles of Champan and Songji from the government, which gives prestige to the whole body. Footnote. Champan is a title of officials of a certain rank in government departments in Seoul, and might be rendered secretary of department. Seungji probably has the same meaning. End footnote. In order to guard their professional interests, the Pansu have local guilds, and in the various sections, clubhouses built out of their own funds. The central office of the Pansu Guild in Seoul was built and maintained by government, and the two chief officials of the guild hold, or held, quasi-official rank. It appears that admission into the fraternity is only granted to an applicant on his giving proof of proficiency in the knowledge of a cumbrous body of orally transmitted shaman tradition, wisdom and custom, much of it believed by the people to be 4,000 years old, and embracing scraps of superstition from the darkest arcana of Buddhism, as well as fragments of Confucianism. The neophyte has to learn of the existence, nature, and power of demons, their relations with man, the efficacy of exorcism through a magic ritual, and the genuine and certain character of the results of divination. He must meditate on the customs, habits, and weaknesses of every class in Korean society in order to deal knowingly with his clients. A slight acquaintance with Confucianism must enable him to give a flavor of learning to his speech, and he must be well drilled in the methods of exorcisms, incantations, magic spells, divination, and the manufacture of charms and amulets. The services of sorcerers or geomancers are invariably called for in connection with the choice of sites for houses and graves, in certain contracts, and on the occasion of unusual calamities, sickness, births, marriages, and the purchase of land. The chief functions of the shaman are the influencing of demons by ritual and magical rites, propitiating them by offerings, exorcisms, and the procuring of oracles. In their methods, dancing, gesticulations, a real or feigned ecstasy, and a drum play an important part. The fees of the shaman are high, and it is believed that at the lowest computation, demonism costs Korea $2,500,000 annually. In order to obtain favors or avert calamities, it is necessary to employ the shamans as mediators, and it is their fees, and not the cost of the offerings, which press so heavily on the people. Among the reasons which render the shaman a necessity are these. In Korean belief, air, earth, and sea are peopled by demons. They haunt every umbrageous tree, shady ravine, crystal spring, and mountain crest. On green hill slopes, in peaceful agricultural valleys, in grassy dells, on wooded uplands, by lake and stream, by road and river, in north, south, east and west, they abound, making malignant sport out of human destinies. They are on every roof, ceiling, fireplace, kung and beam. They fill the chimney, the shed, the living room, the kitchen. They are on every shelf and jar. In thousands they waylay the traveller as he leaves his home, beside him, behind him, dancing in front of him, worrying over his head, crying out upon him from earth, air, and water. They are numbered by thousands of billions, and it has been well said that their ubiquity is an unholy travesty of the divine omnipresence. This belief, and it seems to be the only one he has, keeps the Korean in a perpetual state of nervous apprehension, 
it surrounds him with indefinite terrors, and it may truly be said of him that he passes the time of his sojourning here in fear. Every Korean home is subject to demons, here, there, and everywhere. They touch the Korean at every point in life, making his well-being depend on a continual series of acts of propitiation, and they avenge every omission with merciless severity, keeping him under this yoke of bondage from birth to death. The phrase demon worship, as applied to Korean shamanism, is somewhat misleading. These legions of spirits, which in Korean belief peopled the world, are of two classes, the first alone answering to our conception of demons. These are the self-existent spirits, unseen enemies of man, whose designs are always malignant or malicious, and spirits of departed persons, who, having died in poverty and manifold distresses, are unclothed, hungry, and shivering vagrants, bringing untold calamities on those who neglect to supply their wants. It is true, however, that about 80% of the legions of spirits are malignant. The second class consists also of self-existent spirits, whose natures are partly kindly, and of departed spirits of prosperous and good people, but even these are easily offended and act with extraordinary capriciousness. These, however, by due intercessions and offerings, may be induced to assist man in obtaining his desires, and may aid him to escape from the afflictive power of the evil demons. The comfort and prosperity of every individual depend on his ability to win and keep the favor of the latter class. Koreans attribute every ill by which they are afflicted to demoniacal influence. Bad luck in any transaction, official malevolence, illness, whether sudden or prolonged, pecuniary misfortune and loss of power or position are due to the malignity of demons. It is over such evils that the pansu is supposed to have power and to be able to terminate them by magical rites, he being possessed by a powerful demon whose strength he is able to wield. As an example of the modus operandi, exorcism in sickness, which is believed to be the work of an unclean demon, may be taken. The pansu arrives at the house and boldly undertakes the expulsion of the foul spirit, the process being divided into four stages. 1. By a few throws from the tortoise divining box, the sorcerer discovers the demon's nature and character, after which he seeks for an auspicious hour and makes arrangements for the next stage. 2. Gaining control of the demon follows. The pansu equips himself with a wand of oak or pine a foot and half long, and a bystander is asked to hold this in an upright position on an ironing stone. Magic formulas are recited till the rod begins to shake and even dance on the stone, this activity being believed to be the result of the demon having entered the wand. At this stage a talk takes place to test the accuracy of the divination of the demon's name and nature, and of the cause of the affliction. The pansu manages the questions so dexterously that a simple yes is indicated by motion in the wand, while no is expressed by quiescence. At this stage the demon is given the choice of quietly disappearing, after which, if he is obstinate, the pansu proceeds to dislodge him. 3. The third stage involves the aid of certain familiars of the pansu. A special wand, made of an eastern branch of a peach tree, which has much repute in expelling demons, is taken and is held on a table in a vertical position by an assistant. The pansu recites a farther part of his magical ritual, its power being shown by acute movements in the wand in spite of attempts to keep it steady. A parley takes place with the Changun, the spirit who has been summoned to find out his objects. He promises to catch the Changkun, the malignant demon, and after preparations and offerings have been made, he is asked to search for him. The man who holds the wand is violently dragged by a supernatural power out of the house to the place where the Changkun is. 
Then the Chang'un is supposed to seize him, and the wand holder is dragged back to the house. 4. A bottle with a white mouth is put on the floor, and alongside it a piece of paper inscribed with the name of the unclean demon, which has been obtained by divination and parley. The paper being touched with the magic wand jumps into the bottle, which is hastily corked and buried on the hillside or at the crossroads. This singular form of exorcism has a long and unintelligible ritual, in the cases of those who can afford to pay for it, occupying some days, and at greater or lesser length is repeated daily by the shamans throughout Korea. It is usually succeeded by a form known as the ritual pacification, which takes a whole night. This is for the purpose of restoring order among the household demons, who have been much upset by the previous proceedings, cleaning the house, and committing it and its inmate to the protection of the most powerful members of the Korean demoniacal hierarchy. The instruments of exorcism used by the pansu are offerings to be made at various stages of the process, a drum, cymbals, a bell, a divination box, and a wand or wands. The shamans claim to have derived many of their very numerous spells and formulas from Buddhists, who on their side assert that demon worship was practiced in Korea long before the introduction of Buddhism, and a relic of this worship is pointed out in the custom which prevails in the Korean magistracies of offering to guardian spirits on stone altars on the hills, pigs or occasionally sheep, before sowing time and after harvest, as well as in the case of drought or other general calamity. This sacrifice is offered by the local magistrate in the king's name, and though identical in form with that offered to Hananim, the Lord of Heaven, is altogether distinct from it. Most of the formulae recited by the shamans have the reputation of being unsafe for ordinary people to use, but in consideration of the possibility of a great emergency, one is provided which is pronounced absolutely safe. This consists of 56 characters, which must be recited forwards, backwards, and sideways, and is called the 28 stars formula. Divination is the second function of the pansu, and consists in a forecast of the future by means of rituals, known only to himself, associated with the use of certain paraphernalia. This is used also for finding out the result of a venture, or the cause of an existing trouble, and for casting a man's horoscope, that is, the four columns of a man's future, these being the hour, day, month, and year of his birth, or rather their four combinations. This horoscope is the crowning function of divination. In these four columns, the secret of a man's life is hidden, and their relations must govern him in all his actions. When a horoscope contains an arrow, which denotes ill luck, the pansu corrects the misfortune by formulae used with a bow of peach, with which during the recital he shoots arrows made of a certain reed into a non-prohibited quarter. One of the great duties of divination is to cast the horoscope of a bride and bridegroom for an auspicious day for the wedding, for an unlucky one would introduce demons to the ruin of the new household. The great strongholds of divination are the frog boxes and dice boxes, manufactured for this purpose. The frog box is made like a tortoise, having movable lips, and contains three cash, over which the pansu repeats a very ancient invocation, which has been translated thus, Will all you people grant to reveal the symbols? The coins are thrown three times, and the three folds present him with the combinations of characters, out of which he manufactures his oracle. The second implement of divination is a bamboo or brass tube closed at both ends, but with a small hole in one to allow of the exit of small bamboo splinters, of which it contains eight. The same thing is to be seen on innumerable altars in China. Each splinter has from one to eight notches on it, and stands for a symbol of certain signs on that divining table three thousand years old, called the Ho Pai, which is implicitly believed in by the Chinese. 
two of these splinters give two sets of characters, eight being connected with each symbol. When the pansu has obtained these, he is ready to evolve his oracle. Great reliance is placed on the charms which the pansu make and sell. Probably there are few adults or children who do not wear these as amulets. They are generally made in the form of insects or consist of Chinese characters. They are written on specially prepared yellow paper in red ink and are regarded as being efficacious against illness and other calamities. Amulets are made of the wood of trees struck by lightning, which is supposed to possess magical qualities. End of section 36。section 37 of Korea and her neighbors by Isabella L. Bird。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in June 2021. Chapter 35. Notes on Demonism Concluded. The second and larger division of the shamans consists of the Mutang. Though the Paksu Mu, who are included among the Mutang, are men, the female idea prevails so largely that these wear female clothing in performing their functions, and the whole class has the name of Mutang and is spoken of as female. The Mutang is universally prevalent, and her services are constantly and everywhere sought. She enters upon an office regarded as of high importance with very little ceremonial, requiring only a little instruction from someone who has practiced magic and the supernatural call. This call, of which much is made, consists in the assurance of demoniacal possession, the demon being supposed to seize upon the woman and to become in fact her doppelganger, so completely is his personality superimposed on hers. The demon is almost invariably a member of the Korean demonion, Mr. Jones mentions a woman who claims that her indwelling demon is known as the spirit Chil Song Shin, supposed to come from the constellation of Ursa Major, and he brought with him a legion of other demons, from which the Mutang deceived the honorific title, Man Shin, a legion of spirits. This woman, in her early married life, was ill for three years, and had frequent visions of the spirit and heard but resisted the call. When at last she yielded she was immediately cured and was received into favour with the spirit. On obeying a demon call the woman snaps every tie of custom or relationship, deserts parents, husband or children and obeys the call alone. Her position from that hour is a peculiar one, for while she is regarded as indispensable to the community, she is socially an outcast. In the curious relations of the shamanate, the pansu is obviously the master of the demons, gaining power by cabalistic formulae or ritual to drive them off or even bury them, while the mutang supplicates and propitiates them. It is impossible to live in a place which has not a mutang shaman. The functions of the Mutang are more varied than those of the Pansu, but on a par with his exorcisms may be placed her couts or pacifications and propitiations of demons, which are divided into the occasional and periodic, the latter being demon festivals, one public, the other private. The public one is a triennial festa celebrated either by a large village or by an aggregation of hamlets, and occupies three or four days. Its object is the tutelary demon of the neighborhood, and its methods are sacrifice, petition, worship, and thanksgiving. The villagers choose two of their number to take entire charge of the festival, and by them a tax for expenses is levied on the vicinity. They also choose the festival day, hire the mutang, and arrange for the paraphernalia and the offerings to the demons. It is essential that the festival day should be chosen by divination, by either a Son Li or a Pan Su acquainted with magic, and that the sorcerers should bathe frequently and abstain from animal food for seven previous days. 
The village demon festival has a resemblance at some points to the Shinto Matsuri of Japan. On the festa day, a booth, much decorated with tags of brilliant color, is erected near the demon's shrine, and with an accompaniment of mutang music, dancing, and lavish and outlandish gesticulations, the offerings are presented to the spirits. The popular belief is that the demons become incarnate in the mutang, who utter oracles called Kongsu Nata, and the people bring them bowls of uncooked rice and plead for a revelation of their future during the following three days. A common test at this festival is the burning of a tube of very thin white paper in a bowl. Its upper end is lighted by the mutang who recites her spells as it burns. When it reaches the rim of the bowl, if the augury for the future be unfavorable, the paper burns away in the bowl. If favorable, the paper lifts itself and is blown away. The private festa, the Chol Muri Kaut, one of thanksgiving to the household demons, is necessary to secure a continuance of their good offices. The expenditure of the family resources on this occasion is so lavish as frequently to impoverish the household for a whole year. This festa may be biennial or triennial. At the time a pig is sacrificed, offerings are made, Mutang are hired, and the fetishes of the demons are renewed or cleaned. The ritual for these occasions, if unabbreviated, lasts several days, but among the poor only a selection from it is used. Its stages consist of rituals or invocation, petition, offering, and purification. While these are being recited, a household spirit becomes incarnate in the Mutang, and through her makes oracular revelations of the future. At another stage, deceased parents and ancestors appear in the mutang, and her personation of them is described by an eyewitness as both pathetic and ludicrous. At Seoul, this festival is observed by families at the demon shrines outside the city walls, and not in private houses. One of the very common occasions which requires the presence of a mutang is the ceremonial known as the rite of purification, defilement being contracted by a birth or death, or any action which brings in an unclean demon, whose obnoxious entrance moves the guardian or friendly demons to leave the house. A wand cut from a pine tree to the east of the house is used to bring about their return. It is set working by the muttered utterance of special spells or formulae by the mutang, the mont gari, or tutelary spirit, is found, and by means of prayers and offerings is induced to resume his place, and the unclean demon is exorcised and expelled. The beating of a drum and the frequent sprinkling of pure water are portions of this rite. The utterance of oracles is another great function of the mutang. In spite of the low opinion of women held by the Koreans, so strong is the belief in the complete demoniacal possession of the mutang and their consequent elevation above their sex that the Koreans refer fully as much to them as to the pansu for information regarding the outcome of commercial ventures and of projects of personal advancement, as well as for the hidden causes of the loss of wealth or position or of adversity or illness. The mutang, by an appeal to her familiar demon, in some cases obtains a direct answer, and in others a reply by the divining chime or the rice divination. The latter consists of throwing down some grains of rice on a table and noting the combinations which result. The divining chime is a hazel wand with a circle of bells at one end. These are shaken violently by the mutang, and in the din thus created she hears the utterance of the demon. The arranging for the sale of children to demons is a father function of the mutang, and is carried on to a very great extent. The Korean father desires prosperity and long life for his boy, a girl being of little account, and the sale of the child to a spirit is, he believes, the best way of attaining his object. When the so-called sale has been decided on, 
the father consults the sorceress as to when and where it shall be made. The place chosen is usually a boulder near home, and the child is there consecrated to the demon by the mutang with fitting rites. Thenceforward, on the fifteenth day of the first moon, and the third day of the third moon, worship and sacrifice are offered to the boulder. After this act of sale, the name of the demon becomes part of the boy's name. It is not an unusual thing for the sale to be made to the mutang herself, who, as the proxy of her demon, accepts the child, in case she learns by a magic rite that she may do so. She takes in its stead one of its rice bowls and a spoon, and these, together with a piece of cotton cloth on which the facts concerning the sale of the child are written, are laid up in her own house in the room devoted to her demon. There is a famous Mu Tang, whose house I have been in, just outside the south gate of Seoul, who has many of these, which are placed on tables below the painted daubs of demons ordinarily, but which, on great occasions, are used as banners. At the periodic festivals, offerings are made on behalf of these children, who, though they live with their parents, know the sorceress or mutang as Shin, and are considered her children. The mutang rites are specially linked with the house demon and with Mama, the smallpox demon. The house demon is on the whole a good one, being supposed to bring health and happiness, and if invited with due ceremony, he is willing to take up his abode under every roof. He cannot always keep off disease, and in the case of contagious fevers, etc., he disappears until the rite of purification has been accomplished and he has been asked to return. The ceremonies attending his recall deserve notice. On this great occasion, the mutang in office ties a large sheet of paper round a rod of oak, holds it upright, and goes out to hunt him. She may find him near, as if waiting to be invited back, or at a considerable distance, but in either case he makes his presence known by shaking the rod so violently that several men cannot hold it still, and then returns with the mutang to the house, where he is received with lively demonstrations of joy. The paper which was round the stick is folded, a few cash are put into it, it is soaked in wine, and then thrown up against a beam in the house to which it sticks, and is followed by some rice which adheres to it. That special spot is the abiding place of the demon. This ceremony involves a family in very considerable expense. The universal belief that illness is the work of demons renders the services of a pansu or mutang necessary wherever it enters a house, and in the case of smallpox, the universal scourge of Korean childhood, the demon, instead of being exercised, bottled, or buried, is treated with the utmost respect. The name by which the disease is called, Mama, is the demon's name. It is said that he came from South China and has only infested Korea for 1,000 years. On the disease appearing, the mutang is called in to honor the arrival of the spirit with a feast and fitting ceremonial. Little or no work is done and if there are neighbors whose children have not had the malady, they rest likewise, lest, displeased with their want of respect, he should deal hardly with them. The parents do obeisance, worship to the suffering child, and address is at all times in honorific terms. Danger is supposed to be over after the twelfth day, when the mutang is again summoned and a farewell banquet is given. A miniature wooden horse is prepared, and is loaded for the spirit's journey with small bags of food and money. Fervent and respectful adieus are spoken, and he receives hearty good wishes for his prosperous return to his own place. In the course of many centuries, the office of the mutang has undergone considerable modification. Formerly her power consisted in the foretelling of events by the movements of a turtle on the application of hot iron to his back, and by the falling of a leaf of certain trees. Her present vocation is chiefly mediatorial. It is also becoming partially hereditary, her daughter, or even daughter-in-law, taking up her work. 
the call is considered a grave calamity. Ordinarily, these women are of the lower class. They are frequently worshippers of Buddha, after the gross and debased cult which exists in Korea, and place his picture, along with those of the demons, in the small temples in their houses. Taking the male and female shamanate together, the shamans possess immense power over the people, from the clever and ambitious Korean queen, who resorted constantly to the pansu on behalf of the future of the crown prince, down to the humblest peasant family. They are in intimate contact with the people in all times of difficulty and affliction, their largest claims are conceded, and they are seldom out of employment. The demons whose professed servants the shamans are, and whose yoke lies heavy on Korea, are rarely even mythical beings who might possibly have existed in human shape. They are legion. They dwell in all matter and pervade all space. They are a horde without organization, destitute of genus, species and classification, created out of Korean superstitions, debased Buddhism and Chinese mythical legend. There have been no native attempts at their arrangement, and whatever has been done in this direction is due to the labors of Mr. G. H. Jones and Dr. Landis, from whose lists a few may be chosen as specimens. The U Bang Chang Kun are five, and some of the more important preside over East Heaven, South, West, North, and Middle. In shamans' houses, shrines are frequently erected to them, bearing their collective name to which worship is paid. They are held in high honor and are prominent in Pansu rites. At the entrance of many villages to the south branch of the Han, the villagers represent them by posts with tops rudely carved into hideous caricatures of humanity, which are oft-times decorated with straw tassels and receive offerings of rice and fruit as village protectors. The Xin Chang are demon generals said to number 80,000, each one at the head of a demon host. They fill the earth and air and are specially associated with the Pan Su, who are capable of summoning them by magic formula to aid in divination and exorcism. Shrines to single members of this militant host occur frequently in central Korea, each one containing a highly colored daub of a gigantic medieval warrior and the words, I, the spirit, dwell in this place. The Tok Gabi are the most dreaded and detested, as well as the best known, of all the demon horde. Yet they seem nondescripts, and careful and patient examination has only succeeded in relegating them to the class of such myths as the Will o' the Wisp and Jack o' Lantern, elevated, however, in Korea to the status of genuine devils with fetishes of their own. They are regarded as having human originals in the souls of those who have come to sudden or violent ends. They are bred on execution grounds and battlefields, and wherever men perish in numbers. They go in overwhelming legions, and not only dwell in empty houses, but in inhabited villages, terrifying the inhabitants. They it was who, by taking possession of the fine audience hall of the Mulberry Palace in Seoul, rendered the buildings untenable, frightful tales being told and believed of nocturnal demon orgies amidst those doleful splendors. People leave their houses and build new ones because of them. Their fetishes may be such things as a mapu's hat or the cloak of a yamen clock, rotten with age and dirt, enshrined under a small straw booth. Besides the devilry attributed to the Tok Gabi, they are accused of many pranks, such as placing the covers of iron pots inside them and pounding doors and windows all night, till it seems as if they would be smashed, yet leaving no trace of their work. The actually unclean spirits, the Sagem, the criminal class of the vast demonion, infest Korean life like vermin wandering about embracing every opportunity of hurting and molesting man. 
against these both pansu and mutang wage continual war by their enchantments the pansu by their exorcisms either driving them off or catching them and burying them in disgrace while the mutang propitiate them and send them off in honour Another great group of demons is the Sanshin Ryong, the spirits of the mountains. I found their shrines in all the hilly country, along both branches of the Han, by springs and streams, and specially under the shade of big trees, and on amelopsis covered rocks, a flat rock being a specially appropriate site from its suitability for an altar, and thus specially fortunate. The demon who is the tutelary spirit of ginseng, the most valuable export of Korea, is greatly honoured. So also is the patron demon of deer hunters, who is invariably represented in his shrine as a fierce-looking elderly man in official dress, riding a tiger. Surrounding him are altars to his harem, and there are also female demons, mountain spirits, who are pictured as women frequently japanese the tiger which abounds in central and northern korea is understood to be the confidential servant of these mountain demons and when he commits depredations the people believing the demon of the vicinity to be angry hurry with offerings to its nearest shrine the koreans consider it a good omen when they see in their dreams the mountain demon either is represented in his shrine or under the form of his representative the tiger these mountain demons are specially sought by recluses and people oft-times retire into solitary mountain glens where by bathing fasting and offerings they strive to gain their favour these spirits believed to be very powerful are much feared by farmers and by villagers living near high mountains they think that if when they are out on the hillsides cutting wood they forgot to cast the first spoonful of rice from the bowl to the demon they will be punished by a severe fall or cut or some other accident these spirits are capricious and exacting and for every little neglect take vengeance on the members of a farmer's household or on his crops or cattle the longshin or dragon demons are water spirits they have no shrines but the shamans conduct a somewhat expensive ceremony by the sea and river sides in which they present them with offerings for the repose of the souls of drowned persons the phase of demonolatry which is the most common and the first to arrest a traveller's attention is also the most obscure the song wang dan altar of the holy prince the great Korean altar, rudely built of loose stones under the shade of a tree, from the branches of which are suspended such worthless ex votos as strips of paper, rags, small bags of rice, old clouts, and worn-out shoes, look less like an altar than a decaying cairn of large size. Footnote Mr. G. H. Jones suggests the idea that these uncouth heap of stones were originally munitions of war over which tutelary demons were supposed to brood and thinks that the transition to an altar would be a very natural one End footnote. a peculiarity of the song huang dan is that they are generally supposed to be frequented by various demons though occasionally they are crowned by a shrine to a single spirit Korean travellers make their special plea to a traveller's demon who is supposed to be found there, and hang up strips of their goods in the overhanging branches, and the sailor likewise regards the altar as the shrine of his guardian demon and bestows a bit of old rope upon it. Further than this, when some special bird or beast has destroyed insects injurious to agriculture, the people erect a shrine to it on these altars or cairns, on which may frequently be seen the rude daub of a bird or animal. Two spirits, the Toti Chi Shin and the Chon Shin, are regarded as local demons and occupy spots on the mountain sides. 
they receive worship at funerals, and a sacrifice similar to that offered in ancestral worship is made to them before the body is laid in the earth. Two shamans preside over this, and one of them intones a ritual belonging to the occasion. The shrine of Chon Shin is a local temple, a small decayed erection usually found outside villages. In Seoul, he has a mud or a plaster shrine in which his picture is enshrined with much ceremony, but in the country his fetish is usually a straw booth set up over a pair of old shoes under a tree. For the observances connected with him, all the residents in the neighborhood are taxed. He may be regarded as the chief demon in every district, and it is in his honor that the Mutang celebrate the triennial festival formerly described. The household spirits are the last division of the Korean demonion. Song Ju, the spirit of the rich pole, who presides over the home, occupies a sort of imperial position with regard to the other household spirits. His fetish consists of some sheets of paper and a paper bag, containing as many spoonfuls of rice as the household is years old on the day when the mutang suspends it to the crossbeam of the house. The ceremony of his inauguration was conducted as follows in the case of a householder who was at once a scholar, a noble, a rich man, and the headman of a large village. A lucky day having been chosen by divination, the noble, after grading the site for this house, erected the framework, and with great ceremony attached such a fetish, duly prepared by the pansu, to the crossbeam. Prostrations and invocations marked this stage. When the building of the house was completed, an auspicious day was again chosen by divination, and a great ceremony was performed by the mutang for the enshrining of the demon in the home. The mutang arranged the ceremonial and prepared the offerings, and then, with a special wand only used on these occasions, called the spirit, who is supposed to be under her control, and returning to the house, solemnly enshrined him in the fetish, to which it is correct to add a fresh sheet of paper every year. After Song Ju was supposed to have had time to feed spiritually on the offerings, they were placed before the guests, and a great entertainment followed. Tiju, or the Lord of the Sight, is the next great demon, but investigations regarding him have been very resultless. Little is known, except that offerings are presented to him at some spot on the premises, but not inside the house. These offerings, which are of food, are made on the first, second, third, and fifteenth of each month. This food is afterwards eaten by the family, and a continual offering is represented by a bit of cloth or a scrap of old rope. His fetish is a bundle of straw, empty inside, placed on three sticks, but in some circumstances a flower pot with some rice inside is substituted. Opju, the kitchen demon, is the third of the trio which is permanently attached to the house. His fetish is a piece of cloth or paper nailed to the wall above the cooking place. After these come the demons who are attached to the family and not the house, the first of them being Cho Wang, a spirit of the constellation of the Great Bear, a very popular spirit. His shrine is outside the wall, and his fetish, to which worship is paid, is a gourd full of cloth and paper. Cho Wang is often the demon familiar of a mutang. Ti Ju number two is the fate or luck of the family, and every household is ambitious to secure him. His fetish is a straw booth three feet high, in which is a flower pot containing some rice covered with a stone and paper. The greatest of the family demons is an ancient and historical demon, Choi Sok, who is regarded as the grandfather of San Chin Choi Sok, the demon of nativity. His fetish, unless it becomes rotten or is accidentally destroyed, descends from father to son. He has several fetishes, and when he receives homage at the triennial festival, the mutang puts on the dress of an official. 
he is the demon of nativity and the giver of posterity and is a triple demon korean women hearing of the christian trinity have been known to say that san chin enables them to understand the mystery he is believed to have the control of all children up to the age of four he avenges ceremonial defilement such as the sight by an expectant mother of a mourner or a dead object and outside a house where there has been a recent birth a notice warning visitors not to enter is often put up on his behalf he imposes on plebeian mothers a period of seclusion for twenty-one days after a birth but for noble mothers one hundred days for which period the rays of the sun are rigidly excluded from both mother and child pa mul the demon of riches is the japanese daikoku and the british mammon he is worshipped in the granary and thanks are offered to him as well as petitions his fetish is a paste jar set up on two decorated bags of rice a man in Chemulpo, now a Christian, had a very famous fetish, which was originally a jar of beans, but these were changed into clear water, and a mysterious improvement in the fortunes of the family set in from that date, the jar becoming an object of grateful worship. One day it was found broken and the water lost, and from that time his fortunes declined. Kol Lip is the demon who takes charge of the external fortunes of the family, and is also the mercury of the household demons. His fetish is enshrined over the gatehouse, and consists of a mass of rubbish, old straw shoes for wearing on his travels, cash for spiritual funds, and a fragment of grass cloth for travelling outfit. There is also the demon of the gate, whose fetish hangs over the entrance. Dr. Landis has classified the Korean demons as follows. Spirits high in rank. 1. Spirits of the heavens. 2. Spirits of the earth. 3. Spirits of the mountains and hills. 4. Spirits of the dragons. 5. Guardian spirits of the district. 6. Spirits of the Buddhist faith. Spirits of the house. 7. Spirit of the ridge pole. This is the chief of all the spirits of the house. 8. Spirits of goods and furniture. 9. Spirit demon of the Yi family. 10. Spirit of the kitchen. 11. Attendant spirits of number 9. 12. Spirits which serve one's ancestors. 13. The guards and servants of number 9. 14. The spirits which aid jugglers. 15. Spirits of goods and chattels, like number 8, but inferior in rank. 16. Spirits of smallpox. 17. Spirits which take the forms of animals. 18. Spirits which take possession of young girls and change them into exorcists. 19 spirits of the seven stars which form the dipper twenty spirits of the house site various kinds of spirits twenty one spirits which make men brave twenty two spirits which reside in trees any gnarled shrub or malformed tree is supposed to be the residence of one of these spirits spirits which cause persons to meet either a violent death or to die young. Anyone who has died before reaching a cycle, that is, sixty years, is supposed to have died owing to the influence of one of these spirits. It is needless to say that they are all evil. 23. Spirits which cause tigers to eat men. 24. Spirits which cause men to die on the road. 25. Spirits which roam about the house, causing all sorts of calamities. 26. Spirits which cause a man to die away from home. 27. Spirits which cause men to die as substitutes for others. 28. Spirits which cause men to die by strangulation. 29. 
spirits which cause men to die by drowning. 30. Spirits which cause women to die in childbirth. 31. Spirits which cause men to die by suicide. 32. Spirits which cause men to die by fire. 33. Spirits which cause men to die by being beaten. 34. Spirits which cause men to die by falls. 35. Spirits which cause men to die by pestilence. 36. Spirits which cause men to die by cholera. The belief in the efficacy of the performances of the Mutang is enormous. In sickness, the very poor half starve themselves and pawn their clothing to pay for her exorcisms. Her power has been riveted upon the country for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. The order is said to date back 4,000 years, to have been called in China, where it was under official regulations, Mu Ham. 500 years ago, the founder of the present dynasty prohibited Mu Tang from living within the walls of Seoul. Hence, their houses and temples are found outside the city walls. Women are not Mu Tang by birth, but of late years it has become customary for the girl children of a sorceress to go out with her and learn her arts, which is tending to give the profession a hereditary aspect. It is now recruited partly in this fashion, partly from among hysterical girls, and partly for a livelihood, but outside of these sources, a demon may take possession of any woman, wife, maid, or widow, rich or poor, plebeian or patrician, and compel her to serve him. At the beginning of the possession she becomes either slightly or seriously ill, and her illness may last four weeks or three years, during which time she dreams of a dragon, a rainbow, peach trees in blossom, or of a man in armour who is suddenly metamorphosed into an animal. Under the influence of these dreams she becomes like an insane person, and when awake sees many curious things, and before long speaks as an oracle of the spirits. She then informs her family that messengers from heaven, earth, and the lightning have informed her that, if she is not allowed to practice exorcism, they or their domestic animals will die. Should they insist on secluding her, her illness shortly terminates fatally. If a daughter of a noble family becomes possessed, they probably make away with her, in the idea that if madness takes this turn, the disgrace would be indelible. But things usually go smoothly, and on being allowed to have her own way, the first thing she does is to go into a vacant room and fill it with flowers as an offering to the demons. Then she must obtain the clothing and professional paraphernalia of a deceased mutang. The clothing may be destroyed after the demon has taken full possession of his new recruit, but the drums and other instruments must be retained. After the possessions of the deceased Mutang have been bestowed on the new one who claims them, she proceeds to exercise such bad spirits as may be infesting the donor's house, so as to enable his family to live in peace, after which she writes his name on a tablet, and placing it in a small room, invokes blessings on him for three years. After this ceremonial has been observed, the Mutang, fully possessed by a demon, begins to exercise her very important and lucrative profession. Her equipment consists of a number of dresses, some of them very costly, a drum shaped like an hourglass, four feet in length, copper cymbals, a copper rod with tinklers suspended from it by copper chains, strips of silk and paper banners which float round her as she dances, fans, umbrellas, wands, images of men and animals, brass or copper gongs, and a pair of telescope-shaped baskets for scratching, chiefly used in cases of cholera, which disease is supposed to result from rats climbing about in the human interior. The scratching sound made by a peculiar use of these baskets, which resembles the noise made by cats, is expected to scare and drive away these rodents. The preliminaries of exorcism are, 
that the mutang must subject herself to certain restraints, varying from a month to three days, during which time she must abstain from flesh and fish, and must partially fast. Before an exorcism, ashes are steeped in water, and the sorceress takes off this, and sprinkles it as she walks around the house, afterwards taking pure water and going through the same ceremony. The almost fabulous sums squeezed by the mutang out of the people of Seoul are given in a previous chapter. It will be observed that in Korea sickness is always associated with demoniacal possession, and that the services of the pansu or mutang are always requisitioned. European medicine and surgery are the most successful assailants of this barbarous and degrading system which holds the whole nation, in many respects highly civilized, in bondage, and the influence of both as practiced in connection with medical missions is tending increasingly in the direction of emancipation. It would be impossible to say how far the mutang is self-deceived. In some of her dances, especially in one in which she exercises the demon of the Yi family, one of the most powerful and malignant of the demon hierarchy, she works herself into such a delirious frenzy that she falls down foaming at the mouth, and death is occasionally the result of the frantic excitement. The demon of the Yi family is invoked in every district once in three years by the mutang in a formula which has been translated thus. O master and mistress of our kingdom, may you ever exist in peace. Once in every three years we invoke you with music and dancing. O make this house to be peaceful. If this malignant spirit arrives at a house, he can only be appeased by the death of a man, an ox or a pig. Therefore, when the mutang becomes aware that he has come to a house or neighborhood, a pig is at once killed, boiled and offered up entire. The exorcist takes two knives and dances a sword dance, working herself into a fine frenzy, after which a box is made and a Korean official hat and robes are placed within it, as well as a dress suitable for a palace lady. The box is then placed on the top of the family clothes chest, and sacrifices are frequently offered there. This demon is regarded as the spirit of a rebellious crown prince, the sole object of whose demon existence is to injure all with whom he can come into contact. A man sometimes marries a mutang, but he is invariably a fellow of the baser sort who desires to live in idleness on the earnings of his wife. If, as is occasionally the case, the mutang belongs to a noble family, she is only allowed to exercise spirits in her own house, and when she dies, she is buried in a hole in a mountainside with the whole paraphernalia of her profession. Some mutang do not go abroad for purposes of exorcism. These may be regarded as the aristocracy of their profession, and many of them are of much repute and live in the suburbs of Seoul. Those who desire their services send the necessary money and offerings, and the mutang exercise the spirits in their own houses. The use of straw, ropes, and of pieces of paper resembling the Shinto gohe during incantations, with a certain similarity between the Shinto and the shaman ceremonies, might suggest a common origin, but our knowledge of the demonism of Korea is so completely in its infancy that any speculations as to its kinship can be of little value, and it is only as a very slight contribution to the sum of knowledge of an obscure but very interesting subject that I venture to present these chapters to my readers. The Koreans, it must be remarked, have no single word for demonism or shamanism. The only phrase in use to express their belief in demons who require to be propitiated is Kurshinwi Hanan Kot, the worship of spirits. Pulto is Buddhism, Yuto Confucianism, and Sonto Taoism, but the termination To doctrine has not yet been affixed to demonism. End of chapter thirty seven.
Section 38 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in June 2021. Chapter 36. Seoul in 1897. Footnote. I left Korea for China at Christmas 1895, and after spending six months in travelling in the Chinese Far West, and three months among the Nantai Sun Mountains in Japan, returned in the middle of October 1896, and remained in Seoul until late in the winter of 1896-97. End footnote. It was midnight when, by the glory of an October full moon, I arrived from Chemulpo at the foot of the rugged slope crowned with the irregular, lofty, battlemented city wall and picturesque double-roofed gateway of the Gate of Staunch Loyalty, which make the western entrance to the Korean capital so unique and attractive. An arrangement had been made for the opening of the gate, and after a long parley between the faithful Im and the guard, the heavy iron-bolted door creaked back before the united efforts of ten men, and I entered Seoul, then under the authority of Ye Cha Yun, an energetic and enlightened governor, under whose auspices the western part of the city has lost the refuse heaps and foulness with their concomitant odours which were its chief characteristic. In the streets and lanes not a man, dog, or cat stirred, and not a light glimmered from any casement. But when I reached Chongdong, the foreign quarter, I observed that the lower extremity of every road leading in the direction of the Russian legation was irregularly guarded by several slouching Korean sentries, gossiping in knots as they leaned on their rifles. The grounds of my host's house open on those of the king's new palace, and the king and crown prince, attended by large retinues, were constantly carried through them on their way from their asylum in the Russian legation to perform the customary rites at the spirit shrine, to which the fragmentary remains of the murdered queen had been removed to wait until the geomancers could decide on an auspicious site for her grave, the one which had been prepared for her at an enormous expense some miles outside the city having just been pronounced unlucky. A few days after my arrival, the king went to the Kiangwun Palace to receive a Japanese prince, and courteously arranged to give me an audience afterwards, to which I went, attended, as on the last occasion, by the British legation interpreter. The entrances were guarded by a number of slouching sentries in Japanese uniforms. Their hair, which had been cropped at the time of the abolition of the top knot, had grown again, and hung in heavy shocks behind their ears, giving them a semi-barbarous appearance. At the second gate I alighted, no chair being permitted to enter, and walked to a very simple audience hall, then used for the first time, about twenty feet by twelve feet, of white wood, with lattice doors and windows, both covered with fine white paper and with fine white mats on the floor. The king and crown prince, both of whom were in deep mourning, that is, in pure white robes with sleeveless dresses of exquisitely fine buff grass cloth over them, and fine buff crinoline hats, stood together at the upper end of the room, surrounded by eunuchs, court ladies, including the reigning favourites, the ladies Puck and Om, and court functionaries, all in mourning, the whole giving one an impression of absolute spotlessness. The waists of the voluminous white skirts of the ladies, which are a yard too long for them all round, were as high up as it is possible to place them. The king and crown prince bowed and smiled. I made the required three curtsies to each, and the interpreter adopted the deportment required by court etiquette, crouching, looking down, and speaking in an awestruck whisper. I had not seen the king for two years, a period of great anxiety and vicissitude to him, but he was not looking worn or older, and when I congratulated him on his personal security and the assumption of his regal functions, he expressed himself cordially in reply, with an air of genuine cheerfulness. 
In the brief conversation which followed, the crown prince took part, and showed a fair degree of intelligence, as well as a much improved physique. Later I had two informal audiences of the king in his house in the centre of the mass of the new buildings of the Kyeng Woon Palace. It is a detached Korean dwelling of the best Korean workmanship, with a deep-eaved, tiled roof, the carved beams of which are elaborately painted, and their terminals decorated with the five-petaled plum blossom, the dynastic emblem. The house consists of a hall with a kang floor, divided into one large and two small rooms by sliding and removable partitions of fretwork, filled in with fine tissue paper, the windows which occupy the greater part of both sides being of the same construction. The very small rooms at each end are indicated as the sleeping apartments of the king and his son by pale blue silk mattresses laid upon the fine white mats which cover the whole floor. The only furniture was two ten-leaved white screens. The fastenings of the windows and partitions are of very fine Korean brasswork. Simplicity could not go further. Opposite is the much-adorned spirit shrine of the late queen, connected with the house by a decorated gallery. The inner palace enclosure where these buildings are is very small, and behind the king's house rises into a stone terrace. Numerous as is the king's guard, it is evident that he fears to rely upon it solely, for of two gates leading from his house, one opens into quarters occupied by Russian officers, who arrived in Seoul in the autumn of 1890, at the king's request, for purposes of military organization, and the other into small barracks occupied by the Russian drill instructors of the Korean army. Through the former he could reach the grounds of the English legation in one minute, and after his former experiences, possibilities of escape must be his first consideration. The small buildings of this new palace were already crowded like a rabbit warren, and when completed will contain over 1,000 people, including the bodyguard, eunuchs, and court officials innumerable, writers, readers, palace ladies, palace women, and an immense establishment of cooks, runners, servants, and all the superabundant and useless entourage of an eastern sovereign, to whom crowds and movement represent power. This congeries of buildings was carefully guarded, and even the Korean soldier who attended on me was not allowed to pass the gate. The king had given me permission to take his photograph for Queen Victoria, and I was arranging the room for the purpose, when the interpreter shouted, His Majesty, and almost before I could step back and curtsy, the king and crown prince entered, followed by the officers of the household and several of the ministers, a posse of the new-fangled police crowding the veranda outside. The sovereign, always courteous, asked if I would like to take one of the portraits in his royal robes. The rich crimson brocade and the gold-embroidered plastrons on his breast and shoulders became him well, and his pose was not deficient in dignity. He took some trouble to arrange the crown prince to the best advantage, but the result was unsuccessful. After the operation was over, he examined the different parts of the camera with interest and seemed specially cheerful. At a farewell audience some weeks later, the king reverted to the subject of a British minister accredited solely to Korea, and the interpreter added, as an aside, His Majesty is very anxious about this. He hardly seemed to realize that, even if a change in the representation were contemplated, it could scarcely be carried out while Sir Claude MacDonald, who is accredited to both courts, remains minister at Peking. The king was for more than a year the guest of the Russian legation, an arrangement most distasteful to a large number of his subjects, who naturally regarded it as a national humiliation that their sovereign should be under the protection of a foreign flag. Rumours of plots for removing him to the palace from which he escaped were rife, and there were days on which he feared to visit the Queen's tablet house unless Russian officers walked beside his chair. Mr. Weber, the Russian minister, had then been in Korea twelve years. He is an able and faithful servant of Russia. 
he was trusted by the king and the whole foreign community, and up to the time of the Hegira had been a warm and judicious friend of the Koreans. His guidance might have prevented the king from making infamous appointments and arbitrary arrests, from causelessly removing officials who were working well, and from such reckless extravagances as a costly embassy to the European courts and a foolish increase of the army and police force. But he remained passive, allowing the Koreans to stew in their own juice, acting possibly under orders from home to give Korea rope enough to hang herself, a proceeding which might hereafter give Russia a legitimate excuse for interference. Apart from such instructions, it must remain an inscrutable mystery why so excellent a man and so capable a diplomatist, when absolutely master of the situation, neglected to aid the sovereign with his valuable advice, a course which would have met with the cordial approval of all his colleagues. Be that as it may, the liberty which the king has enjoyed at the Russian legation and since has not been for the advantage of Korea and recent policy contrasts unfavorably with that pursued during the period of Japanese ascendancy, which, on the whole, was in the direction of progress and righteousness. Old abuses cropped up daily, ministers and other favorites sold offices unblushingly, and when specific charges were made against one of the king's chief favorites, the formal demand for his prosecution was met by making him vice-minister of education. The king, freed from the control of the mutinous officers and usurping cabinet of 8th October 1895, from the queen's strong though often unscrupulous guidance, and from Japanese ascendancy, and finding himself personally safe, has reverted to some of the worst traditions of his dynasty, and in spite of certain checks, his edicts are again law and his will absolute and it is a will at the mercy of any designing person who gets hold of him and can work upon his fears and his desire for money, of the ladies Puck and Om who assisted him in his flight, and of favourites and sycophants low and many, who sell or bestow on members of their families offices they have little difficulty in obtaining from his pliable good nature. With an ample civil list and large perquisites, he is the most impecunious person in his dominions, for in common with all who occupy official positions in Korea, he is surrounded by hosts of grasping parasites and hangers-on, forever clamouring, give, give. Men were thrown into prison without reason, some of the worst of the Kanai were made ministers of state, the murderer of Kim ok Yun was appointed master of ceremony, and a convicted criminal, a man whose life has been one career of sordid crime, was made Minister of Justice. Consequent upon the surreptitious sale of offices, the seizure of revenue on its way to the Treasury, the appointment of men to office for a few days to give them rank and to enable them to quarter on the public purse a host of impecunious relations and friends, and the custom among high officials of resigning office on the occasion of the smallest criticism, the administration is in a state of constant chaos, and the oft-times well-meaning but always vacillating sovereign, absolute without an idea of how to rule, the sport of favourites, usually unworthy, who work upon his amiability, the prey of greedy parasites, and occasionally the tools of foreign adventurers, paralyzes all good government by destroying the elements of permanence and renders economy and financial reform difficult and spasmodic by consenting to schemes of reckless extravagance urged upon him by interested schemers never has the king made such havoc of reigning as since he regained his freedom under the roof of the russian embassy i regret to have to write anything to the king's disadvantage Personally, I have found him truly courteous and kind, as he is to all foreigners. He has amiable characteristics, and I believe a certain amount of patriotic feeling. But as he is an all-important element of the present and future condition of Korea, 
it would be misleading and dishonest to pass over without remark such characteristics of his character and rule as are disastrous to korea bearing in mind in extenuation of them that he is the product of five centuries of a dynastic tradition which has practically taught that public business and the interests of the country mean for the sovereign simply getting offices and pay for favorites and that statesmanship consists in playing off one minister against another novelties in the soul streets were the fine physique and long gray uniforms of colonel putiata and his subordinates three officers and ten drill instructors who arrived to drill and discipline the korean army the american military adviser having proved a failure while the troops drilled by the japanese were mutinous and rapacious and the japanese drill instructors had retired with the rest of the regime this military commission was doing its work with characteristic vigor and thoroughness and the flat-faced pleasant-looking non-commissioned officers with their drilled slouch serviceable uniforms and long boots were always an attraction to the crowd a novelty too was the sight of the korean cadet corps of thirty-seven young men of good families and seven officers marching twice daily between the drill ground of the korean troops close to the king pok palace and their own barracks behind the russian legation with drums beating and colors flying these young men who are to receive a two years military education from russian officers are under severe discipline and were greatly surprised to find that servants were a prohibited luxury and that their training involved the cleaning and keeping bright of their own rifles and accoutrements and hard work for many hours of the day the army now consists of four thousand three hundred men in seoul eight hundred of whom are drilled as a bodyguard for the king and one thousand two hundred in the provinces in japanese uniforms and equipped so far as they go with three thousand burden rifles presented by russia to korea the drill and words of command are russian a standing army of two thousand men would have been sufficient for all purposes in korea and as far as her need goes an army of six thousand is an unblushing extravagance and a heavy drain on her resources it is most probable that a force drilled and armed by russia accustomed to obey russian orders and animated by an intense hereditary hatred of japan would prove a valuable corps d'armee to russia in the event of war with that ambitious and restless empire the old kesu or gendarmes with their picturesque dresses and long red plumes are now only to be seen and that rarely in attendance on officials of the korean government seoul is now policed much over policed for it has a force of one thousand two hundred men when a quarter of that number would be sufficient for its orderly population everywhere numbers of slouching men on and off duty in japanese semi-military uniforms with shocks of hair behind their ears and swords in nickel-plated scabbards by their sides suggest useless and extravagant expenditure the soldiers and police by an unwise arrangement made by the japanese and now scarcely possible to alter are enormously overpaid the soldiers receiving five dollars and a half a month all found and the police from eight to ten only finding their food the korean army is about the most highly paid in the world the average korean in his great baggy trousers high perishable broad-brimmed hat capacious sleeves and long flapping white coat is usually a docile and harmless man but european clothes and arms transform him into a truculent insubordinate and ofttimes brutal person without civic sympathies or patriotism greedy of power and spoil detachments of soldiers scattered through the country were a terror to the people from their brutality and marauding propensities early in eighteen ninety seven and unless russian officers are more successful than their predecessors in disciplining the raw material an overpaid army too large for the requirements of the country may prove a source of weakness and frequent disorder 
Seoul, in many parts, especially in the direction of the south and west gates, was literally not recognizable. Streets, with a minimum width of 55 feet, with deep, stone-lined channels on both sides, bridged by stone slabs, had replaced the foul alleys, which were breeding grounds of cholera. Narrow lanes had been widened, slimy runlets had been paved, roadways were no longer free cool for refuse, bicyclists scorched along broad level streets, express wagons were looming in the near future, preparations were being made for the building of a French hotel in a fine situation, shops with glass fronts had been erected in numbers, an order forbidding the throwing of refuse into the streets was enforced, refuse matter is now removed from the city by official scavengers, and Seoul, from having been the foulest, is now on its way to being the cleanest city of the Far East. This extraordinary metamorphosis was the work of four months, and is due to the energy and capacity of the Chief Commissioner of Customs, ably seconded by the capable and intelligent governor of the city, Ye Cha Yun, who had acquainted himself with the working of municipal affairs in Washington, and who, with a rare modesty, refused to take any credit to himself for the city improvements, saying that it was all due to Mr. Mlevi Brown. Old Seoul, with its festering alleys, its winter accumulations of every species of filth, its ankle-deep mud and its foulness, which lacked the redeeming element of picturesqueness, is being fast improved off the face of the earth. Yet it is chiefly a restoration, for the dark, narrow alleys, which lingered on till the autumn of 1896, were but the result of gradual encroachments on broad roadways, the remains of the marginal channels of which were discovered. What was done, and is being done, was to pull down the houses, compensate their owners, restore the old channels, and insist that the houses should be rebuilt at a uniform distance behind them. Along the fine broad streets thus restored, tiled roofs have largely replaced thatch. In many cases the lower parts of the walls have been rebuilt of stone instead of wattle, and attempts at decoration and neatness are apparent in many of the house and shop fronts, while many of the smoke holes, which vomit forth the smoke of the Kang fires directly into the street, are now fitted with glittering chimneys, constructed out of American kerosene tins. Some miles of broad streets are now available as promenades and are largely taken advantage of. Business looked much brisker than formerly, the shops made more display, and there was an air of greater prosperity, which has been taken advantage of by the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, which has opened a branch at Chemul Po, and will probably ere long appear in the capital. It is not, however, only in the making of broad thoroughfares that the improvement consists. Very many of the narrow lanes have been widened, their roadways curved and graveled, and stone gutters have been built along the sides, in some cases by the people themselves. Along with much else, the pungent, peculiar odor of soul has vanished. Sanitary regulations are enforced, and civilization has reached such a height that the removal of the snow from the front of the houses is compulsory on all householders. So great is the change that I searched in vain for any remaining representative slum which I might photograph for this chapter as an illustration of Seoul in 1894. It must be remarked, however, that the capital is being reconstructed on Korean lines and is not being Europeanized. Chongdong, however, the quarter devoted to foreign legations, consulates and mission agencies, would have nearly ceased to be Korean had not the king set down the Kyengwon Palace with its crowded outbuildings in the midst of the foreign residences. Most of the native inhabitants have been bought out. Wide roads with foreign shops have been constructed. The French have built a legation on a height, which vies in grandeur with that of Russia and the American Methodist Episcopal Mission has finished a large red brick church, which, like the Roman cathedral, can be seen from all quarters. 
the picturesque Peking Pass, up and down whose narrow, rugged pathway generations of burdened baggage animals toiled and suffered, and which had seen the splendors of successive Chinese imperial envoys at the accession of the Korean kings, has lost its identity. Its rock ledges, holes, and boulders have disappeared. The rocky gash has been widened, and the sides chiseled into smoothness, and under the auspices of the Russian minister, a broad road with retaining walls and fine culverts now carries the traffic over the lowered height. Many other changes were noticeable. The Taiwan Kun, for so many years one of the chief figures in Korean politics, was practically a prisoner in his own palace. The eastern and western palaces, with their enormous accommodation and immense pleasure grounds, were deserted, and were already beginning to decay. The Japanese soldiers had vacated the barracks so long occupied by them close to the King Pok Palace, and, reduced to the modest numbers of a legation guard, were quartered in the Japanese settlement. Parties of missionaries who had hived off from Chongdong were occupying groups of houses in various parts of the capital, and there was a singular boom in schools, accompanied by a military craze, which affected not the scholars only, but the boys of Seoul generally. But it must be remarked in connection with education in Korea, that so lately as the close of 1896, a book called Confucianist Scholar's Handbook of the Latitudes and Longitudes had been edited by Shin Ki Sun, Minister of Education, prefaced by two councillors of the Education Department and published at government expense, in which the following sentences occur. Page 52. Europe is too far away from the centre of civilization, that is, the Middle Kingdom. Hence, Russians, Turks, English, French, Germans, and Belgians look more like birds and beasts than men, and their languages sound like the chirping of fowls. Again, According to the views of recent generations, what Westerners call the Christian religion is vulgar, shallow, and erroneous, and is an instance of the vileness of barbarian customs, which are not worthy of serious discussion. They worship the heavenly spirits, but do not sacrifice to parents. They insult heaven in every way, and overturn the social relations. This is truly a type of barbarian vileness, and is not worthy of treatment in our review of foreign customs, especially as at this time the religion is somewhat on the wane. Europeans have planted their spawn in every country of the globe except China. All of them honor this religion, but we are surprised to find that the Chinese scholars and people have not escaped contamination by it. On page 42 it is said, Of late the so-called Yesu Kyo, Christianity, has been trying to contaminate the world with its barbarous teachings. It deceives the masses by its stories of heaven and hell, it interferes with the rites of ancestral worship, and interdicts the custom of bowing before the gods of heaven and earth. These are the ravings of a disordered intellect and are not worth discussing. Page 50 How grand and glorious is the empire of China, the Middle Kingdom! She is the largest and richest in the world. The grandest men of the world have all come from the Middle Empire. This tirade from an official pen was thought worthy of a remonstrance from the foreign representatives. The graceful Pai Lo, near the Peking Pass, at which generations of Korean kings had publicly acknowledged Chinese suzerainty, by awaiting there the imperial envoy who came to invest them with regal rights, was removed, and during my sojourn the foundation of an arch to commemorate the assumption of independence by Korea in January 1895 was laid near the same spot, in presence of a vast concourse of white-robed men. An independence club, with a disused royal pavilion near the stumps of the Pai Lo for its clubhouse, had been established to commemorate and conserve the national autonomy, and though the entrance fee is high, had already a membership of 2,000. After a number of patriotic speeches had been made on the occasion of the laying of the foundation of the Independence Arch, 
The club entertained the foreign legations and all the foreign residents at a recherché collation in this building. Speeches were made both by Koreans and the foreign representatives, and an extraordinary innovation was introduced. Waiters were dispensed with, and the committee of the club, the governor of Seoul, and several of the ministers of state themselves attended upon the guests with much grace and courtesy. One of the most important events in Seoul was the establishment, in April 1896, by Dr. Jison of the Independent, a two-page, tri-weekly newspaper in English and the Korean script, enlarged early in 1897 to four pages and published separately in each language. Only those who have formed some ideas of the besotted ignorance of the Korean concerning current events in his own country and of the credulity which makes him the victim of every rumor set afloat in the capital, can appreciate the significance of this step and its probable effect in enlightening the people and in creating a public opinion which shall sit in judgment on regal and official misdeeds. It is already fulfilling an important function in unearthing abuses and dragging them into daylight, and is creating a desire for rational education and reasonable reform, and is becoming something of a terror to evildoers. Dr. Jison, So Chia Pil, is a Korean gentleman educated in America and has the welfare of his country thoroughly at heart. The sight of newsboys passing through the streets with bundles of a newspaper in Enmun under their arms and of men reading them in their shops is among the novelties of 1897. Besides the Independent, there are now in Seoul two weeklies in Enmun, the Korean Christian Advocate and the Christian News, and the Korean Independence Club publishes a monthly magazine, the Chosen, dealing with politics, science, and foreign news, which has 2,000 subscribers. Seoul has also a paper, the Kanjo Shimbo, or Seoul News, in mixed Japanese and Korean script, published on alternate days, and there are newspapers in the Japanese language, both in Fusan and Chimulpo. All these, and the admirable Korean repository, are the growth of the last three years. The faculty of combination, by which in Korea as in China the weak find some measure of protection against the strong, is being turned to useful account. This Kye, or principle of association, which represents one of the most noteworthy features of Korea, develops into insurance companies, mutual benefit associations, money-lending syndicates, tontines, marriage and burial clubs, great trading guilds, and many others. With its innumerable associations, only a few of which I have alluded to, Korean life is singularly complex, and the Korean business world is far more fully organized than ours, nearly all the traders in the country being members of guilds powerfully bound together and having the common feature of mutual helpfulness in time of need. This habit of united action, and the measure of honesty which is essential to the success of combined undertakings, supply the framework on which various joint stock companies are being erected, among which one of the most important is a tannery. Korean hides have hitherto been sent to Japan to be manufactured, owing to caste and superstitious prejudices against working in leather. The establishment of this company, which brought over Japanese instructors to teach the methods of manufacture, has not only made an end of a foolish prejudice, in the capital at least, but is opening a very lucrative industry, and others are following. As may be expected in an Oriental country, the administration of law in Korea is on the whole infamous. It may be said that a body of law has yet to be created, as well as the judges who shall administer it equably. A mixed committee of revision has been appointed, but the Korean members show a marked tendency to drop off, and no legal reform, solely the work of foreigners, would carry weight with the people. Mr. Greathouse, a capable lawyer and legal adviser to the law department, has been able to prevent some infamous transactions, 
but on the whole the sole law court does little more than administer injustice and receive bribes of the two law courts of the capital the supreme court under the supervision of the minister and vice-minister of justice and in which the foreign adviser sits with the judges to advise in important cases is the most hopeful yet one of the most disgraceful of late appointments has been in connection with this department the outrageous decisions the gross bribery and the actual atrocities of the sole court are likely to bring about its abolition and i will not enlarge upon them one of the most striking changes introduced into the soul of 1897 is the improvement in the prison, which is greatly owing to Mr. A. B. Stripling, formerly of the Shanghai Police, who, occupying a position as adviser to the police department, is carrying out prison reforms, originally suggested by the Japanese, in a humane and enlightened manner. Torture has disappeared from the great city prison, but there were dark rumours that some of the political prisoners, so lately as January 1897, were subjected to it elsewhere. My experience of eastern prisons, chiefly in Asia Minor, China, Persia, and a glimpse of a former prison in Seoul, have given me a vivid impression of the contrast presented by the present system. Surrounding a large quadrangle, with the chief jailer's house in the centre, the rooms, not to be called cells, are large, airy, light, and well ventilated, with boarded floors covered with mats and plenty of air space below. It is true that on the day I visited them, some of the prisoners were shivering, and shivered more vigorously as an appeal to my compassion, but then the mercury was at 18 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is not a usual temperature. They have a large bathroom with a stove on the Japanese plan. Their diet consists of a pint of excellent soup twice a day, with a large bowl of rice, and those who go out to work get a third meal. This ample diet costs one penny and a farthing per day. There were from twelve to eighteen prisoners in each ordinary room, and fifty were awaiting trial in one roomy hall. A few under sentence, two of them to death, were long wooden kangs, but I did not see any fetters. They are allowed to bring in their own mattresses, mats, and pillows for extra comfort. On the whole they were clean, cleaner than the ordinary coolies outside. A perforated wooden bar attached to the floor, with another with corresponding perforations above it, secures the legs of the prisoners at night. The sick were lying thickly on the hot floor of a room very imperfectly lighted, but probably the well would have been glad to change with them. There were 225 prisoners altogether, all men. Classification is still in the future. Murderers and pilferers occupied the same room, and colonels of regiments accused of a serious conspiracy were with convicted felons, who might or might not be acting as spies and informers. A very fine-looking man, sentenced for life, the first magistrate in Korea ever convicted and punished for bribery, and that on the complaint of a simple citizen, was in a cell with criminals wearing kangs. Some of the sentences seemed out of proportion to the offences, as, for instance, a feeble old man was immured for three years for cutting and carrying off pine brush for fuel, and an old blind man of some position was incarcerated for ten years for the violation of a grave under circumstances of provocation. Much has been done in the way of prison reform, and much remains to be done, especially in the direction of classification, but still the great Seoul prison contrasts most favourably with the prisons of China and other unreformed Oriental countries. Torture is at least nominally abolished, and brutal exposures of severed heads and headless trunks, and beating and slicing to death, were made an end of during the ascendancy of Japan. After an afternoon in the prison of Seoul, I could hardly believe it possible that only two years before I had seen several human heads hanging from tripod stands and lying on the ground in the throng of a business street, and headless bodies lying in their blood on the road outside the east gate. To mention the changes in Seoul would take another chapter. 
Dr. Allen, now U.S. Minister to Korea, said that the last four months of 1896 had seen more alterations than the previous twelve years of his residence in the country, and the three months of my last visit brought something new every week. As a foil to so much that is indicative of progress, I conclude this chapter by mentioning, on the authority of the Governor of Seoul, that in January 1897 there were in the capital a thousand mutang or sorceresses, earning on an average fifteen dollars a month each, representing an annual expenditure by that single city of a hundred and eighty thousand dollars on dealings with the spirits, exclusive of the large sums paid to the blind sorcerers for their services and to the geomancers, whose claim on the occasion of the interment of any one of rank and wealth are simply monstrous. End of section 38「The patient reader has now learned with me something of Korean history during the last years, as well as of the reorganized methods of government and the education, trade, and finance of the country. He has also, by proxy, travelled in the interior, and has lived among the peasant farmers, seeing their industries, the huckstering which passes for trade, something of their domestic life and habits, and the superstitions by which they are enslaved, and has acquired some knowledge of the official and patrician exactions under which they suffer. He has seen the Koreans at home, with their limpness, laziness, dependence, and poverty, and Koreans under Russian rule raised into a thrifty and prosperous population. He can to some extent judge for himself of the prospects of a country which is incapable of standing alone and which could support double its present population, and of the value of a territory which is possibly coveted by two powers. Having acted as his guide so far, I should like to conclude with a few words on some of the subjects which have been glanced at in the course of these volumes. Korea is not necessarily a poor country. Her resources are undeveloped, not exhausted. Her capacities for successful agriculture are scarcely exploited. Her climate is superb, her rainfall abundant, and her soil productive. Her hills and valleys contain coal, iron, copper, lead, and gold. The fisheries along her coastline of 1,740 miles might be a source of untold wealth. She is inhabited by a hardy and hospitable race, and she has no beggar class. On the other hand, the energies of her people lie dormant. The upper classes, paralyzed by the most absurd of social obligations, spend their lives in inactivity. To the middle class no careers are open, there are no skilled occupations to which they can turn their energies. The lower classes work no harder than is necessary to keep the wolf from the door, for very sufficient reasons. Even in Seoul, the largest mercantile establishments have hardly risen to the level of shops. Everything in Korea has been on a low, poor, mean level. Class privileges, class and official exactions, a total absence of justice, the insecurity of all earnings, a government which has carried out the worst traditions on which all unreformed oriental governments are based, a class of official robbers steeped in intrigue, a monarch enfeebled by the seclusion of the palace and the pettinesses of the seraglio, a close alliance with one of the most corrupt of empires, the mutual jealousies of interested foreigners, and an all-pervading and terrorizing superstition, have done their best to reduce Korea to that condition of resourcelessness and dreary squalor in which I formed my first impression of her. Nevertheless, the resources are there, in her seas, her soil, and her hardy population. 
A great and universal curse in Korea is the habit in which thousands of able-bodied men indulge of hanging or sorning on relations or friends who are better off than themselves. There is no shame in the transaction, and there is no public opinion to condemn it. A man who has a certain income, however small, has to support many of his own kindred, his wife's relations, many of his own friends, and the friends of his relatives. This partly explains the rush for government offices and their position as marketable commodities. To a man burdened with a horde of hangers-on, the one avenue of escape is official life, which, whether high or low, enables him to provide for them out of the public purse. This accounts for the continual creation of offices, with no other real object than the pensioning of the relatives and friends of the men who rule the country. Above all, this explains the frequency of conspiracies and small revolutions in Korea. Principle is rarely at stake, and no Korean revolutionist intends to risk his life in support of any conviction. Hundreds of men, strong in health and of average intelligence, are at this moment hanging on for everything, even their tobacco, to high officials in Seoul, eating three meals a day, gossiping and plotting misdeeds, the feeling of honourable independence being unknown. When it is desirable to get rid of them, or it is impossible to keep them longer, offices are created or obtained for them. Hence, government employment is scarcely better than a free coup for this class of rubbish. The factious political disturbances which have disgraced Korea for many years have not been conflicts of principle at all, but fights for the government position which gives its holder the disposal of offices and money. The suspiciousness which prevents high officials from working together is also partly due to the desire of every minister to get more influence with the king than his colleagues, and so secure more appointments for his relations and friends. The author of the Korean Dictionary states that the word for work in Korean is synonymous with loss, evil, misfortune, and the man who leads an idle life proves his right to a place among the gentry. The strongest claim for office which an official puts forward for a protégé is that he cannot make a living. Such persons, when appointed, do little, and often nothing, except draw their salaries and squeeze where they can. I have repeated almost ad nauseam that the cultivator of the soil is the ultimate sponge. The farmers work harder than any other class and could easily double the production of the land, their methods, though somewhat primitive, being fairly well adapted to the soil and climate. But, having no security for their gains, they are content to produce only what will feed and clothe their families, and are afraid to build better houses or to dress respectably. There are innumerable peasant farmers who have gone on reducing their acreage of culture year by year, owing to the exactions and forced loans of magistrates and young bands, and who now only raise what will enable them to procure three meals a day. It is not wonderful that classes whose manifest destiny is to be squeezed should have sunk down to a dead level of indifference, inertia, apathy, and listlessness. In spite of reforms, the Korean nation still consists of but two classes, the robbers and the robbed. The official class recruited from the young bands, the licensed vampires of the country, and the ha-in, literally low men, a residuum of fully four-fifths of the population, whose raison d'être is to supply the blood for the vampires to suck. Out of such unpromising materials the new nation has to be constructed, by education, by protecting the producing classes, by punishing dishonest officials, and by the imposition of a labour test in all government offices, that is, by paying only for work actually done. That reforms are not hopeless, if carried out under firm and capable foreign supervision, is shown by what has been accomplished in the Treasury Department in one year. No Korean office was in a more chaotic and corrupt condition, 
and the ramifications of its corruption were spread all through the provinces. Much was hoped when Mr. Mlevy Brown accepted the thankless position of financial adviser, from his known force of character and remarkable financial capacity, but no one would have ventured to predict what has actually occurred. Although his efforts at financial reform have been thwarted at every turn, not alone by the rapacity of the king's male and female favourites, and the measureless cunning and craft of corrupt officials, who incite the sovereign to actions concerning money, which are subversive of the fairest schemes of financial rectitude, but by chicane, fraud, and corruption in every department, by the absence of trustworthy subordinates, by infamous traditional customs, and the fact that every man in office, and every man hoping for office, is pledged by his personal interest to oppose every effort at reform actively or passively, Korean finance stands thus at the close of 1897. In a few months the Augean stable of the Treasury Department in Seoul has been cleansed, the accounts are kept on a uniform system, and with the utmost exactitude. Value received precedes payments for work, an army of drones, hanging on to all departments and subsisting on public money, has been disbanded. A partial estimate has been formed of the revenue which the provinces ought to produce. Superfluous officials, unworthily appointed, find that their salaries are not forthcoming. Every man entitled to receive payment is paid at the end of every month. Nothing is in arrears. Great public improvements are carried out with a careful supervision which ensures rigid economy. The accounts of every department undergo strict scrutiny. No detail is thought unworthy of attention, and instead of Korea being bankrupt, as both her friends and enemies supposed she would be in July 1896, she closed the financial year in April 1897 with every account paid and a million and a half in the treasury, out of which she has repaid one million of the Japanese loan of three millions. If foreign advisers of similar calibre and capacity were attached to all the departments of state, similar results might in time be obtained. One thing is certain, that the war and the period of the energetic ascendancy of Japan have given Korea so rude a shake, and have so thoroughly discredited various customs and institutions previously venerated for their antiquity, that no retrograde movements, such as have been to some extent in progress in 1897, can replace her in the old grooves. Seoul is Korea, for most practical purposes, and the working of the Western leaven, the new impulses and modes of thought introduced by Western education, the inevitable contact with foreigners, and the influence of a free press are through Seoul slowly affecting the nation. Under the shadow of Chinese suzerainty, the Korean Yangban enjoyed practically unlimited opportunities for the exhortions and tyrannies which were the atmosphere of patrician life. Japan introduced a new theory on this subject, and practically gave the masses to understand that they possess rights which the classes are bound to respect, and the press takes the same line. It is slowly dawning upon the Korean peasant farmer, through the medium of Japanese and Western teaching, that to be an ultimate sponge is not his inevitable destiny, that he is entitled to civil rights, equality before the eye of the law, and protection for his earnings. The more important of the changes during the last three years, which are beneficial to Korea, may be summarized thus. The connection with China is at an end, and with the victories of Japan, the Korean belief in the unconquerable military power of the Middle Kingdom has been exploded, and the alliance between two political systems essentially corrupt has been severed. The distinction between patrician and plebeian has been abolished, on paper at least, along with domestic slavery, and the disabilities which rendered the sons of concubines ineligible for high office. Brutal punishments and torture are done away with, a convenient coinage has replaced cash, 
an improvised educational system has been launched. A disciplined army and police force has been created. The Chinese literary examinations are no longer the test of fitness for official employment. A small measure of judicial reform has been granted. A railroad from Chimulpo to the capital is being rapidly pushed to completion. The pressure of the trades guilds is relaxed. A postal system efficiently worked and commanding confidence has been introduced into all the provinces. The finances of the country are being placed on a sound basis. The change from a land tax paid in kind to one which is an assessment in money on the value of the land greatly diminishes the opportunities for official squeezing, and large and judicious retrenchments have been carried out in most of the metropolitan and provincial departments. Nevertheless, the Government Gazette of the 12th of August, 1897, contains the following royal edicts. 1. We have been looking into the condition of the country. We have realized the imminent danger which threatens the maintenance of the nation. But the people of both high and low classes do not seem to mind the coming calamity and act indifferently. Under the circumstances, the country cannot prosper. We are depending upon our ministers for their advice and help, but they do not respond to our trust. How are we going to bring the nation out of its chaotic condition? We desire them to pause and to think that they cannot enjoy their homes unless the integrity of the nation is preserved. We confess that we have not performed our part properly, but our ministers and other officials ought to have advised us to refrain from wrongdoing, as their ancestors had done to our forefathers. We will endeavour to do what is right and proper for our country hereafter, and we trust our subjects will renew their loyalty and patriotism in helping us to carry out our aim. Our hope is that every citizen in the land will consider the country's interest first before thinking of his private affairs. Let us all join our hearts to preserve the integrity of our country. 2. The welfare of our people is our constant thought. We realize that since last year's disturbance, our people have been suffering greatly on account of lack of peace and order. The dead suffers as much as the living, but the government has not done anything to ameliorate the existing condition. This thought makes us worry to such an extent that the affluence by which we are surrounded is rather uncomfortable. If this fact is known to our provincial officials, they will do their best to ameliorate the condition of the people. Compulsory collection of unjust taxes and thousands of lawless officials and government agents rob the helpless masses upon one pretense or another. Why do they treat our people so cruelly? We hereby order the provincial officials to look into the various items of illegal taxes now being collected and abolish them all without reservation. Whoever does not heed this edict will be punished according to the law. Footnote. The good intentions of the Korean sovereign, as well as the weakness which renders them ineffective, are typically illustrated in these two pathetic documents. End footnote. Though the Koreans of today are the product of centuries of disadvantages, yet after nearly a year spent in the country, during which I made its people my chief study, I am by no means hopeless of their future, in spite of the distinctly retrograde movements of 1897. Two things, however, are essential. 1. As Korea is incapable of reforming herself from within, that she must be reformed from without. 2. That the power of the sovereign must be placed under stringent and permanent constitutional checks. Hitherto I have written exclusively on Korean internal affairs, her actual condition, and the prospects of the social and commercial advancement of the people. I conclude with a few remarks on the political possibilities of the Korean future and the relations of Korea with certain other powers. The geographical position of Korea, 
with a frontier conterminous with those of China and Russia, and divided from Japan by only a narrow sea, has done much to determine her political relationships. The ascendancy of China grew naturally out of territorial connection, and its duration for many centuries was at once the cause and effect of a community in philosophy, customs, and to a great extent in language and religion. But Chinese control is at an end, and China can scarcely be regarded as a factor in the Korean situation. Japan, having skillfully asserted her claim to an equality of rights in Korea, after several diplomatic triumphs and marked success in obtaining fiscal and commercial ascendancy, eventually, by the overthrow of her rival in the late war, secured political ascendancy likewise, and the long strife between two empires, of which Korea had been the unhappy stage, came to an end. The nominal reason for the war, to which the Japanese government has been careful to adhere, was the absolute necessity for the reform of the internal administration of a state too near the shores of Japan to be suffered to sink annually deeper into an abyss of misgovernment and ruin. It is needless to speculate upon the ultimate object which Japan had in view in undertaking this unusual task. It is enough to say that she entered upon it with great energy, and that, while the suggestions she enforced introduced a new regime, struck at the heart of privilege and prerogative, revolutionized social order, and reduced the sovereign to the position of a salaried automaton, the remarkable ability with which her demands were formulated gave them the appearance of simple and natural administrative reforms. I believe that Japan was thoroughly honest in her efforts, and though she lacked experience and was oft-times rough and tactless, and aroused hostile feeling needlessly, that she had no intention to subjugate, but rather to play the role of the protector of Korea and the guarantor of her independence. For more than a year, in spite of certain mistakes, she made fair headway, accomplished some useful and important reforms, and initiated others. And it is only just to her to repeat that those which are now being carried out are on the lines which she laid down. Then came Viscount Miura's savage coup, which discredited Japan and her diplomacy in the eyes of the civilized world. This was followed by the withdrawal of her garrisons and of her numerous advisers, controllers and drill instructors, and the substitution of an apparently laissez-faire policy for an active dictatorship. I write apparently because it cannot for a moment be supposed that this sagacious and ambitious empire recognized the unfortunate circumstances in Korea as a finality and retired in despair. The landing of Japanese armies in Korea, and the subsequent declaration of war with China, while they gave the world the shock of a surprise, were, as I endeavoured to point out briefly in Chapter 8, neither the result of a sudden impulse, nor of the shakiness of a ministry which had to choose between its own downfall and a foreign war. The latter view could only occur to the most superficial student of Far Eastern history and politics. Japanese, for several centuries, has regarded herself as possessing vested rights to commercial ascendancy in Korea. The harvest of the Korean seas has been reaped by her fishermen, and for three hundred years her colonies have sustained a more or less prosperous existence at Fusan. Her resentment of the pretensions of China in Korea, though debarred for a considerable time from active exercise, first by the policy of seclusion pursued by the Tokugawa house, and next by the necessity of consolidating her own internal polity after the restoration, has never slumbered. To deprive China of a suzerainty which, it must be admitted, was not exercised for the advantage of Korea, to consolidate her own commercial supremacy, to ensure for herself free access and special privileges, to establish a virtual protectorate under which no foreign dictation would be tolerated, to reform Korea on Japanese lines, 
and to substitute her own liberal and enlightened civilization for the antique oriental conservatism of the peninsula are aims which have been kept steadily in view for forty years replacing in part the designs which had existed for several previous centuries in order to judge correctly of the action or inaction of japan during eighteen ninety six and eighteen ninety seven it must be borne in mind not only that her diplomacy is secret and reticent but that it is steady and that it has not hitherto been affected by any great political cataclysms at home that it has less of opportunism than that of almost any other nation and that the japanese have as much tenacity and fixity of purpose as any other race also japanese policy in korea is still shaped by the same remarkable statesmen who from the day that japan emerged upon the international arena have been recognized by the people as their natural leaders and who have guided the country through the manifold complications which beset the path of her enlightened progress with a celerity and freedom from disaster which have compelled the admiration of the world the assassination of the korean queen under the auspices of viscount miura and the universal horror excited by the act rendered it politic for japan to keep out of sight till the storm which threatened to wreck her prestige in korea had blown over this temporary retirement was arranged with consummate skill there were no violent dislocations the garrisons which were to be withdrawn quietly slipped away and were replaced by guards only sufficient for the protection of the japanese legation the japanese telegraph and other property the greater number of the japanese in korean government employment fell naturally out of it as their contracts expired and quietly retired from the country ministers of experience proved ability and courtesy of demeanor have succeeded to the post once occupied by mr otori and viscount miura there has been scarcely any recent interference with korean affairs and the japanese colonists who were much given to bullying and blustering are on greatly improved behavior the most objectionable among them having been recalled by orders from home diplomatically japan has carefully avoided friction with the korean government and the representatives of the other powers but to infer from this that she has abandoned her claims or has swerved from her determination to make her patronage essential to the well-being of korea would be a grave mistake it has been said that whatever japan lost in korea russia gained it is true that the king in his terror and apprehension threw himself upon the protection of the russian minister and remained for more than a year under the shelter of the russian flag and that at his request a russian military commission arrived to reorganize and drill the korean army that russia presented three thousand burden rifles to korea that a russian financier spent the autumn of eighteen ninety six in seoul investigating the financial resources and prospects of the country and that the king warned by disastrous experiences of betrayal prefers to trust his personal safety to his proximity to the russian military quarters but russian ascendancy in the sense of control in which japanese ascendancy is to be understood has never existed the russian minister used the undoubtedly influential position which circumstances gave him with unexampled moderation and only brought his influence to bear on the king in cases of grave misrule the influence of russia however grew quietly and naturally with little of external manifestation up to march eighteen ninety seven when the publication of a treaty concluded ten months before between russia and japan caused something of a revulsion of feeling in favor of the latter country and russia has been slowly losing ground her policy is too pacific to allow of a quarrel with japan and a quarrel would be the inevitable result of any present attempt at dictatorship in korea so far she has pursued a strictly opportunist policy taking no steps except those which have been forced upon her and even if the korean pair were ready to drop into her mouth i greatly doubt if she would shake the tree 
At all events, Russia let the opportunity of obtaining ascendancy in Korea go by. It is very likely that she never desired it. It may be quite incompatible with other aims at which we can only guess. At the same time, the influence of Japan is quietly and steadily increasing. Certainly the great object of the triple intervention in the treaty negotiations in Shimonoseki was to prevent Japan from gaining a foothold on the mainland of the Asiatic continent, but it does not seem altogether impossible that, by playing a waiting game and profiting by previous mistakes, she, without assuming a formal protectorate, may be able to add, for all practical purposes of commerce and emigration, a mainland province to her empire. Forecasts are dangerous things, but it is safe to say that if Russia, not content with such quiet military developments as may be in prospect, were to manifest any aggressive designs on Korea, Japan is powerful enough to put a brake on the wheel. Footnote. As it is the unexpected which happens, it would not be surprising if certain moves, ostensibly with the object of placing the independence of Korea on a firm basis, were made even before these volumes are published. End footnote. Korea, however, is incapable of standing alone, and unless so difficult a matter as a joint protectorate could be arranged, she must be under the tutelage of either Japan or Russia. If Russia were to acquire an actual supremacy, the usual result would follow. Preferential duties and other imposts would practically make an end of British trade in Korea with all its large potentialities. The effacement of British political influence has been effected chiefly by a policy of laissez-faire, which has produced on the Korean mind the double impression of indifference and feebleness, to which the dubious and hazy diplomatic relationship naturally contributes. If England has no contingent interest in the political future of a country rich in undeveloped resources and valuable harbours, and whose possession by a hostile power might be a serious peril to her interests in the Far East, her policy during the last few years has been a sure method of evidencing her unconcern. Though we may have abandoned any political interest in Korea, the future of British trade in the country remains an important question. Such influence as England possesses, being exercised through a non-official channel and therefore necessarily indirect, is owing to the abilities, force and diplomatic tact of Mr. Mlevy Brown, the Chief Commissioner of Customs, formerly of Her British Majesty's Chinese Consular Service. So long as he is in control at the capital, and such upright and able men as Mr. Hunt, Mr. Oysen, and Mr. Osborne are commissioners at the treaty ports, Appendix D, so long will England be commercially important in Korean estimation. The customs revenue, always increasing, and collected at a cost of 10% only, is the backbone of Korean finance, and everywhere the ability and integrity of the administration give the commissioners an influence which is necessarily in favour of England, and which produces an impression even on corrupt Korean officialism. That this service should remain in our hands is of the utmost practical importance. In the days of Japanese ascendancy, there was a great desire to upset the present arrangement, but it was frustrated by the tact and firmness of the chief commissioner. The next danger is that it should pass into Russian hands, which would be a severe blow to our prestige and interests. Some of the leading Russian papers are agitating these questions, and the Novoye Vremia of 9th September 1897, in writing of the opening of the ports of Mokpo and Chinampo to foreign trade, says, these encroachments are chiefly due to the cleverness of the British officials who are at the head of the financial and customs department of the Korean administration. It adds, if Russia tolerates any further increase in this policy, Great Britain will convert the country into one of her best markets. The Novoye Vremia goes on to urge the Russian government to exercise, before it is too late, 
a more searching surveillance than at present, to take steps to reduce the number of British officials in the Korean government, the customs, and to compel Japan to withdraw what are practically the military garrisons which she has established in Korea. Such, in brief outline, is the position of political affairs in Korea at the close of 1897. Her long and close political connection with China is severed. She has received from Japan a gift of independence which she knows not how to use. England, for reasons which may be guessed at, has withdrawn from any active participation in her affairs. The other European powers have no interests to safeguard in that quarter, and her integrity and independence are at the mercy of the most patient and the most ambitious of empires, whose interests in the Far East are conflicting, if not hostile. It is with great regret that I take leave of Korea, with Russia and Japan facing each other across her destinies. The distaste I felt for the country at first passed into an interest which is almost affection, and on no previous journey have I made dearer and kinder friends, or those from whom I parted more regretfully. I saw the last of Seoul in snow, in the blue and violet atmosphere of one of the loveliest of her winter mornings, and the following day left Chemulpo in a north wind of merciless severity in the little government steamer Hienik for Shanghai, where the quaint Korean flag excited much interest and questioning as she steamed slowly up the river. End of section 39 End of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird Thanks for listening.